Hello. Hello. All right. Did you set the camera to a uh... the speaker view? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I did. Following instructions like a channel, right? <laughs> Hey, ladies and gents, we're going to get going pretty quickly here. Just bear with us a minute or two. We'll see if there's any last minute joiners here. Um, we did have, I think, a couple more than this sign up, but you know, life tends to get in the way sometimes. Let's give them a minute or two. Um, and I'm seeing some links being posted there from Mr. Ferguson and from Harmony. So those that are already in the group here with us, um, if you keep the chat window open, you can throw some questions at us as the night goes on. Um, and it'll be a good place where Harmony will keep dropping the lineup from time to time if we have anybody join in late, um, as we just have. So you have an idea as to the order, we're going to pour these things in for you. All right, another one coming in now. All right, instead of keeping us uh, on our traditional start late kind of agenda, we're going to get started pretty much on time tonight. Uh, if it ends up being that there are a lot of joiners, we'll just kind of slow down the pace. But I think uh, it's kind of cool to do an event where we actually start on time. Uh, my name's Kurt. I take care of a bunch of the stuff on the whiskey side. And my partner in crime, Harmony, is also somebody on the whiskey side who takes care of things and people. Um, Harmony, if you want to give a quick introduction for yourself, and then I'll jump in behind you. Sure. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, my name is Harmony Pollock. I am new to the Kensington Wine Market team. Um, today is actually my three months uh, with Kensington and I'm very happy to be here and part of the team. I do have about 11 years of industry experience um, working in selling wine and spirits and I've grown to just become passionate over uh, sharing whiskey with other people. Um, so this is uh, this is exciting to do an introduction uh, to Scotch whiskey class with you people today because uh, I think introducing people to whiskey is um, one of my top highlight, I think, to, to the job. Yes, trying whiskey is great, but introducing people uh, to Scotch whiskey is ultimately what brings me the most joy. So thank you all for signing up and being a part of tonight's event. Did you say today was your free month? Yeah. Is that why you weren't in the shop today? Was this like a uh, make sure I'm not around to screw this up on the last day sort of thing? That's right. Yeah. Really? I'll stay okay. quiet behind, let all the benefits kick in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, folks, my name is Kurt Robinson. Uh, I've been at Kensington for probably about four, four and a half years now, but I've been in the whiskey world much, much longer. Um, it kind of started with just a passion and a small group of people. We started sharing a bunch of stuff, buying a bunch of stuff, and um, inevitably spending way too much on it, of course. And there's a lot of bottles you buy and don't necessarily like. So I'd found myself at a point where I was just hauling bags of open bottles over to my friends and just giving them away. I was like, surely there's got to be cheaper ways to do this. So I started like having big clubs set up. I started blogging. Um, I started leading tours. Uh, I started going over to Scotland myself and then eventually got to a point where I started leading tours over that way. Um, contributing to the whiskey industry in terms of writing and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, so I've been around the block a little bit. Um, I don't know what that says for the state of my liver, but hopefully there's a few stories we can share along the way and uh, a little bit of knowledge. Um, I think we want to do something a little bit quirky tonight, a little bit different to not have this just be a classroom type scenario. So I think what we're going to do is sort of, we'll have a decent little introduction here. We'll walk through a few things first. And then we're gonna go through our whiskeys and kind of just bounce back and forth. I recommend keeping some in the glass. Um, it gives you a chance to, you know, as your palate gets acclimatized, to bounce back and check it out and go, oh, okay, I see what I missed now. Or uh, let the whiskey actually evolve because it's gonna change in the glass. So just because we talk at a certain pace or introduce the whiskeys at a certain pace, don't feel like you have to finish them. Um, fortunately, there's nobody that needs to theoretically drive home from here. If you do, be very, very careful. Make sure you have rides arranged. Um, the best part about these Zoom tastings is being able to clean up in two minutes and not have to be talking about it. Um, so we'll bounce back and forth from these, but I don't want it to be too classroom type scenario. So we'll keep opening it up to questions. Harmony and I are gonna kind of have a little bit of dialogue as to how we feel on certain topics that are kind of prevalent in the whiskey industry. Um, Harmony said, are we gonna see some pictures? And that was, uh, was that this morning or last night? I think that was last night. All right. I was like, okay, yeah, sure. We'll get some pictures together. So I've combed through some old folders and stuff and thrown together a few pictures so you can actually see it. So 
because I can't see you all in front of me, normally we'd ask, you know, whose first tasting is this? And, um, you know, kind of gauge the level of knowledge. So we're not really going to do that today. We're just going to talk. If we throw any terms out there that you're unfamiliar with, throw a question in the chat, throw a hand up, by all means, um, let's make sure it doesn't go unanswered tonight. Um, we chose a lineup. This was fun for me. Uh, I think Harmony would probably say the same because with these sort of tastings, we get to pick things we want to taste. We get to think, pick things that um, kind of tell a story, like we build a narrative and we get to, as Harmony said earlier, share things that we're kind of passionate about. So there's some of these bottles I'm super stoked to revisit. Um, I think there's even one or two that are new to me. And Harmony said there's a whole bunch here. New to her. So this will be a, a fun one to go through. Um, last thing before we dive in and do some cool stuff here. Um, I want to introduce a few of our upcoming events for you. I'm going to share my screen briefly here. Uh, there are some cool, cool events coming up here. So let me just make sure I've got the window open to the right place. Make sure I can scroll for you. Are we up and running there? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. All right. So introduction to Scotch whiskey. You guys are here, so we won't push that one too hard on you. Yeah. Oh. I'm freezing. Yeah, that's okay. Give it a second. I see it's loading. It. We did that last time when we were trying to um, screen scroll. I don't know if you have the ability to open the site, Harmony, to that page. Well, we can let people know about some of the stuff that's upcoming. Sure. In the meantime, we can just talk about a few that we know that are coming up. Absolutely. Um, I think you are hosting the one that is probably the most exciting for the shop right now. You can tell us. Uh, is that the Kilhoman? No, that's the Women in Whiskey one. <laughs> a joke. Of course, it's the Women in Whiskey event. Um, yeah, that's coming up in mid-March. Um, I love doing the women in whiskey events. Um, for whatever reason, there's still a lot of stigma in the whiskey world uh, about women, whether they drink it, if they like it, uh, you know, how involved are they in making it? So uh, the great thing about this event is we get to do an event, uh, a whiskey tasting based around all the women at different levels and aspects of the whiskey industry. Um, some of them are going to join us and share their experiences. Um, and, and just in general, we're just going to talk about whiskey, um, you know, however we want, which is exciting. I didn't know you had guests. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, we, we have a few guests and hopefully we'll have a few, few videos or personalized uh, messages uh, from women around the world. Did you manage to find a page there? I... You know what? If not, I will just open it up on my phone and we'll read. <laughs> it's not adaptable here. For sure. I know that there's a Kilhoman event coming up. Those of you who are uh, private members already, uh, the Scotch. Uh, Scotch okay. Whiskey Study. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah. Yeah, their, their February line is dropping, which is fantastic. Um, Evan, so those of you that have been around the shop a little bit, maybe uh, I've seen one of our managers, Evan, he's really, really keen on a lot of the North American stuff. So we have one coming up on February 8th. I think it's only a week away. Um, he's called it the Rye Renaissance. Um, we're going to do a whole bunch of really cool rye whiskeys. And shh, rumor mill says, you know, that Alberta premium cask strength that everybody's so keen to get their hands on. It will be poured. And there is a possibility for attendees to get their hands on a bottle of that stuff too. Um, couple that are sold out, we won't get too deep on. There's a fantastic bubbles and chocolate tasting. Uh, my wife's a bubbles girl, so she'll probably be a part of that. Um, one spot left for our Into the boutique Whiskey Verse with Dave Worthington. Dave's a blast. Somebody needs to scoop that last spot because the whiskeys are always really cool and quirky. Um, there's generally a little bit of dodgy activity and things said that are kind of a little bit sketchy because a lot of those labels lead to those sort of stories. So you'll understand more if you scoop that last spot. Um, wine versus whiskey, perfect night for relationships like I have in my house. Um, my wife and I both drink wine, both drink whiskey, but uh, there's definitely a preference for um, one of us more so than the other. 
And there are still a few spots left for Kilholman that Aunt, um, Harmony was hinting at earlier. I can't believe there are 11 spots left for Kilholman. You guys know how much we love them. Peated whiskey, heavy, heavy peat, really cool casks. This is going to be a banger of a taste. Sorry, Harmony, you were going to say. Uh, I'm just actually honestly shocked to hear you say the words, I drink wine. I do. Because most days around the office, you do not drink wine and don't really want to talk wine. Yeah. Um, so this is, I am learning something new today about you, which is exciting. Yeah. We have seven drams to share. By the end of this, it's going to be like a game of truth or dare for this crew. Um, <laughs> no, it won't. Everybody keep your clothes on. We can't see whether you're wearing pants from here and that's okay. That's how these tastings roll. Um, one caveat I want to add to this uh, with these tasting events coming up. Um, we are really, really struggling, much as is most of the world right now with logistics nightmares and availability of some things. Uh, we struggle to find sample bottles to pour for these events, and we are now struggling with lids. Uh, believe it or not, we found a great deal on sample bottles, but couldn't find lids that would actually fit. So it's been stopgap measure after stopgap measure to try to get these things done. So if you buy into any more tastings, I know um, Elena said already oh, signed up, I think that was for the women in whiskey when we were getting all kind of geeky on that one. Um, if you do sign up, I we generally post when they're going to be available. If for whatever reason it's not available at the time, bear with us. We are trying to keep to that schedule, but we are literally pouring one tasting at a time based on sourcing just enough lids to make that happen. So we'll get them done as quick as possible. Andrew did want me to bang the drum for one last thing before we jump into whiskey with both feet. Um, there's a malt messenger coming out tomorrow. So if you are whiskey folks um, chasing special bottles, special events, those kind of things, this is where we announce all the cool stuff. Um, they said it's a real special malt messenger. So go to our website, go down to the bottom, put your email in, sign up for the malt messenger if you haven't already. It, uh, I know there's some cool, cool products coming in and most of them now, because the demand is so stupid, are reply to that link there and it'll be a lottery type scenario for a lot of those bottles. So um, Elena, really sweet. We just don't have a way to sterilize them, unfortunately, um, much like most bars type things you have a glass like rinser sort of thing but we don't have pegs for them to be up on or anything like that or a way to handle the lids um i had a buddy drop off a box full of them to me which is great for my club but i can bring them home and wash it i love my store but i'm just not willing to do that for the store so. <laughs> uh, all right so let's drink some whiskey um let's pour our first whiskey i think and let's nose our first whiskey while we talk about the styles of whiskey and a couple other things yeah yeah. Right. Harmony, you want to take us into it? Uh, sure. So our first whiskey, uh, if you haven't seen, I did post the order on our chat. Um, I can post it again for those who may not have seen it. Um, we're doing a Cooper's Choice Strathclyde here. It is a 1993, 26-year-old, bottled at cask strength. So what that means is no water added. Um, since we're, we're talking about an introduction and the basics, we're just going to talk really simply about your label and what all of these mean, all these words. So uh, Cooper's Choice is an independent bottler, which means they don't distill any whiskey. They buy the whiskey and they either work on their own aging process or just bottling it uh, at their own desire. Uh, Strathclyde is the distillery where the whiskey is made. Uh, the, the year 1993, that's when it was distilled and went into the barrel, not when it came out and went into the bottle. So 26 years later, we have the result at uh, natural uh, alcohol by volume 52.5. So for those of you who are new, that is hot. That, that, that's, that's a warm whiskey. Um, but there's ways to enjoy it and there's ways to get around the heat. So Kurt was doing one thing that's really helpful in just getting to know the whiskey. If you're a little worried about that 52.5% alcohol, we can just start by simply smelling it. Um, that's really the best way to taste your whiskey. Um, in the whiskey world, we call it nosing. So go ahead and give it a nose, but don't, uh, don't be too eager and stick your nose in the glass if you're not used to it. Uh, don't swirl it around and then stick your nose in the glass for sure. You might toast your sensories there. But uh, beautiful on the on the nose, actually, very vibrant, very tropical. There's a great question from David, and we're going to come to so many answers as the night goes on. So if we if questions come up as they do naturally, we try to answer them on the fly. 
it just might mean we repeat a little bit later to uh, to come around to a kind of cohesive narrative for you. Um, the, the question is, how can a 26-year-old sell for only 191? Man, it wasn't that long ago when most 26-year-olds sold for that. And that was great single malt whiskeys. Um, this is a perfect time to introduce the styles of whiskey, I think, while we're going at this one. So just really, really quick and dirty, um, single malt whiskey is kind of the Cadillac of the whiskey world, the Scotch whiskey world. And that's primarily what we're looking at, but just generally the whiskey world. Um, there's a different style of whiskey that's a bit more delicate. It's called single grain. I'll come around to explain that in just a sec. The world's biggest selling whiskey is just blended whiskey, however. It accounts for about 87% of the market share now. It used to be even higher than that. It used to be over 90% of the market share. Um, single malts have risen quite a bit. Um, and then you have two kind of subcategories that are um, a little bit specialist. So single malt whiskey is the key. It's the driver for flavors. It's built on impurities. It's rich. It's beautiful, um, given time and being handled properly, of course. Um, single grain whiskeys are the other mainstream in the whiskey world. And that's what Harmony's introduced us to here in the Strat Clyde. It's not made from malted barley, where you get named single malt. It's made from a different grain. So we generalize all the other grains together. It's a little bit of a cheat, to be honest with you. It can be anything that's a single grain. Basically, you need something that will give you sugar that you can then ferment and make alcohol out of. In this case, it's probably corn. I didn't actually check as to what the Strathclyde distillery is working with. It can be maize, it can be rice, sorghum, wheat, rye, anything like that can count as a single grain whiskey. When I'm nosing a single grain, to me, Harmony, I want your notes on this one too. They always come across to me like pancakes and maple syrup and lumber yards. And they're like Canadian whiskey with a lot more age on it. Like it's got all those hallmarks of nice Canadian whiskey where it's very wood driven, very clean, very instant. Yeah, totally. Um, it, it, they definitely do remind me of like some old crown royals, yep. <laughs> you know, like the, the orphan barrels. Yep. Um, but yeah, this, uh, I love uh, the value you get out of a single grain whiskey though. Like you said, like shocked in 26 years for 191. How? Well, it's because it's grain and uh, they do age beautifully. Um, yeah. yeah. The malting process costs a lot. Uh, barley is a commodity that's in a lot of demand, of course. Um, grain whiskeys are made in a drastically different process as well. So. When we get a little bit romantic about Scotland, I'm going to show you a little tour here briefly. Um, we'll show you what the stills look like and stuff. This style of whiskey is made in a different manner where it's just to produce high volume alcohol. It comes off the stills of 94.5% of the Strathclyde distillery in Glasgow. 94.5%. Diageo owns a distillery similar to Strathclyde, which is owned by Shivas. Diageo's distillery, Cameron Bridge, produces about 135 million liters a year of neutral grain spirit, coming off at about 94% or something. Um, if they water it down to 40% and they bottle it, it's their Smirnoff line. If they run botanicals through it, or run it through botanicals, I should say, using the botanical basket and still, uh, it's Tanqueray. And if they take that spirit and they put it in wood for at least three years, it can now be called whiskey and is a grain whiskey it's used to prop up single malts in the blend of whiskey. It's basically barrel-aged vodka, but it softens, gets a little vanilla-y, a little cinnamon, and takes all the barrel character. Um, and it's a way of making whiskey more affordable. Um, that's where it really does. It's, it's, mm. Harmony, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I wasn't uh, going to interrupt. Although Greg uh, did have a question. He said, do we know what grain is being used in this Cooper's Choice? Um, the answer is... No, I, I do believe it's corn, but it couldn't be 100%. Yeah, I would think it's corn. It could be any sort of mixed mash bill. We are going to talk about mashing and all the pulp process in just a minute here. Um, it could be it could be anything, again, any kind of grain that can be used to get sugar. Um, so I've had a little bit of difficulty um, screen sharing when it was a website or something. So I'm hoping there's no difficulty here when I try to show you a few photographs and we'll kind of, if I have to pop them up one at a time, we'll do that. But I want you to see the whiskey making process and I'll share a little bit as to how it's done really quickly. 
Um, and then we'll go into whiskey number two. And again, keep some in your glass if you can. I know it can get awful thirsty when you want to move on to whiskey number two, uh, but bear with us a sec there. All right. Do we have visual there? Yeah. Perfect. All right. That's a malt floor. I'm going to stop sharing because it's blink and I don't know if you guys are getting black. Oh, it's good. It's good. It's working for you? Yeah. Okay. That's a malt floor. This is barley that has been steeped. It's been soaked in water and it's had the water drained off after a long period and it's been laid out to germinate now. It's been tricked into sprinkling, thinking it's spring. It's kind of the way, you know, they typically romanticize it. So this barley lays out. Um, it's about six inches deep, give or take, maybe a little deeper. It starts as these, um, as this process is taking place, as the germination process is taking place, it starts to generate a lot of heat. Um, so this barley has to be turned regularly. So let's see if we can move on to the second picture. Sorry, not cooperating too well here. That's all right. Hey, I uh, did some research and Strathclyde mainly uses wheat for their grain. Mm -hmm. So I believe that this bottling, uh, for this bottle, it is wheat. Right. Yeah. And you could possibly see that it's light and creamy and stuff. You generally strip out a lot of character through distillation, um, especially in, in column distillation, like we're doing here. Um, but there's still some soft character there. Mm -hmm. All right. Very, are these images still showing up for you, Harmony? They are. I see little sprouting barleys. Yes. Forgive me. I can't remember the name of those little sprouts. This is the barley now germinating. There, the sprouts are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Again, this, this barley's got to be turned every few hours. The heat causes it to really, really go fast at the bottom. All these shoots grow out, they start to entangle together and it'll just create a, a carpet. It's gonna be no good to them unless it gets turned regularly. Um, so once it gets to a certain point, you wanna halt this process. Uh, typically, it's gonna be air dry. So Scotch whiskey, the one thing we always get people saying is, I want something not too peaty. Um, there's a, an overarching thought, I think, that. All Scotch whiskey is peaty and that's the flavor that people recognize. It's not. What you recognize is kind of just the, the spirit profile with the spice of wood happening um, and the effects of fermentation basically. Um, peating is something that only a handful of distilleries in Scotland though do on the regular. Uh, there's probably about 10 that are really, really well renowned for their peating. And there's probably another decent chunk that are now doing at least part-time peating, but that's not why they're known. And you're not liable to find it without noting the bottle says peated on it. Um, so most barley is gonna be air dry. It's not gonna have that smoky medicinal kind of character. When you want that character that turns it into beach bonfires and burning shoes in your mouth and looking ashtrays and all that kind of fun stuff, you want peat. Peat is literally cut out of the ground. The peat bogs it is death and decay. It is, um, you know, I can't remember how I heard somebody word it. It is death plus water minus oxygen plus time equals this kind of thing, right? Um, and your peat is going to flavor your whiskey, but think about it this way. Peat is literally composed of whatever has died there. Vegetative, hopefully nothing too animalian or <laughs> anything like that. Um, but if you live somewhere like Isla, somewhere where it's very windswept with oceanic breezes and salt water from everything, decaying seaweed and stuff. When that stuff decays, it generally gets kind of ammonia-like and um, iodine-rich and stuff. Um, if your peat is harvested from the mainland, it's probably gonna be more floral and heather driven. So here's a peat bank where they're cutting the peat out of the ground. It then dries for a period. The irony of leaving it out in Scotland to dry where it never stops raining. I don't know. <laughs> But it will season dry for a few months. Um, you can see a peat bank here. We use tools to cut it out into big bricks like this. These bricks have no smell. They're maybe mildly earthy, but you have to reach for that even, especially when they're dry. There's literally like almost nothing to them. They only start to smell when you burn them. 
Yeah, that's that Pete Reek they talk about. Right. Here's Springbank's Pete Harmony, just a big old mess. Oh, it looks like there's some humanoid <laughs> decomp in there. Right. Um, so they're going to burn that peat in a kiln. It's going to rise up a chimney, probably about a story or so. And there's going to be a mesh graded floor like this. Um, the barley will be laid out here about a foot deep. It will be turned in here as well, typically. But that peat smoke is going to permeate the barley for hours and hours and hours to get that peat in this. We'll come to a couple of these styles of whiskey back. After the barley is dried, it goes into something called a mash tun. Look at this archaic beast at Springbank. It looks like something from the Dark Ages or something, a torture device. Oh, it looks like some of these slides are out of order here. So we're gonna to come to it at another time here. Uh, that one shouldn't have been there. <laughs> um, so we gotta mill that barley that's now dried and ready to go. Here's an example of an old bobby mill. These mills were apparently so well designed they never needed replacement parts and the companies put themselves out of business, believe it or not. I believe it. Look at it. It looks new for how old it is. It's incredible. These things are beastly. All right. So when you mill your barley, um, you can't just grind it all down as fine as you want. It's not going to work. What you need to do is grind it down. You need to add water to it and you need to suck that sugary water out. That sugary water is called wort and that's what you're going to ferment to make a beer. You're going to then distill that beer. So after they've milled the barley, this is what you get. It's a mix of flour and what they call grist, and what they call husks. You need a decent ratio. The middle ratio is generally about 80%. The other two are gonna be less than 10 typically, or some variant thereof on, on the 10s. Um, the flour is gonna be the easiest to extract the sugar from, but it also turns to paste, as you probably know. The husks are just gonna create a filter that lets everything run through, it's too fine. So that's why the bulk of it has to be somewhere between. You put it in a mash tun and start adding water to it. Three waters at varying temperatures, getting hotter and hotter progressively just to help extract as much as we can out of it. You can see the water being added. And there's the empty mash tun at Springbank where that last slide was out of place. Oops, my bad. Um, after the mashing process, all of that sugary water is gonna go into these massive vessels. They look like great big barrels called washbacks. So here's a view of a few of them. You can see the graded floor there. You kind of try to peek down through these massive barrels. They're probably, I don't know, 15 feet across, but they're probably 25 feet tall as well. You see, they're absolutely massive. They get filled to about halfway, maybe a bit more, and then they dump yeast in there. And that yeast is going to start to eat those sugars. It's going to create alcohol and carbon dioxide. So venting is key here. Um, there you can see the yeast at work. It's going to foam. It's going to bubble until it's eaten most of that sugar and given us something like this. This is called wash. At this point, it's a beer, basically. Um, in this case, I was at the Ardbeg Distillery. So it's a very, very, very smoky beer at this point. Um, it generally has a bit of a yellow color. It's very hazy. And apparently it runs through you very, 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 very quickly. So um, the locals know if they're kind of bunged up, this is where you go to get things moving again. Um, now it comes to distillation. The still you see here to the left-hand side is the wash still. You can generally tell because there's a window in it. So this is where we put the beer first. The first distillation is gonna take it to about 20% and it's gonna be called a low wine. We want to be able to see through because it's going to be quite volatile because it's it's water. It's going to boil quickly and easily, and we're just trying to capture the quick vapors off of it. The second distillation is where we're going to take that low wine and move it over into our spirit still, and the spirit still is going to take that up to about 70%, give or take, and generally a little bit higher than that. So there's an example of a still room. Another one, I believe this is for more. This is Ardenho, the new one on Isla. You can tell they've all got some character, different still sizes, different mm -hmm. types. All right. As the spirit is captured from the stills, and we're going to talk about this a bit more afterwards, it runs through something called the spirit set. Um, this allows control over which part is captured. It's very, very important you don't capture the whole spirit run as it starts to come across. Um, this is how it looks coming through the safe. It's just a very, very clear spirit. 
you can see some green. We're going to talk about what the stills are doing too and why there's some green in there. And this is what's coming across in the stills. So you can see the first one to the left there is the low lines. It's really, really murky. All right. Second one is the four shots. So that's when we've started distilling. Look at how much copper is coming through in there from the stills itself and how much nastiness and impurity is in there. You obviously don't want them in your barrel because that's going to end up in your bottle. So you want to run that until that goes all clear, until that nastiness is gone. The middle one, or sorry, the second from the right here, the new make spirit, as the bottle says, at 81%, is the heart of the spirit. Right? That's the sweet spot. That's what they're trying to capture. And then at the back end, they have what they call the faints. And they're going to be nasty, kind of poisonous, to be honest with you. Really, really gross stuff. You don't want that either. So they cut that off. So the heart of the spirit run is key. And once you've got that key, this is where it all starts to get a little bit more, who knows what happens. Your spirit goes into wood. And if you're lucky enough to get behind the doors in one of these places, you're probably going to get to try some stuff. Natural. Do you have photos from your travels, Kurt? These are all from different travels. Yeah. So we've got just a couple more. We'll get through them. And then we don't have to talk about my travels anymore because it's not a, a show and tell. It's pretty cool. Um, but the process, this is the back end of the process. We've now made spirit. Spirit needs to become whiskey in order to make people excited. So it goes into barrels of all different sizes, shapes, um, ages, um, refill times, etc. Yeah. It sleeps for at least three years, always in oak, in order to be called Scotch whiskey. A little low warehousing we saw there on the previous slide done its warehousing usually only racked about three high tiny little earthen floors we're seeing more and more racked warehousing in scotland where it's going higher and higher it's different it's not quite so romantic yeah. um, a special special warehouse if you can get in and try these drams out of the barrels um pretty pretty special to get your hands on these sort of things and, <laughs> yeah, and so that was um one of the last trips i took over um one of the gentlemen that came with me fell in love with a barrel of Kalila while we were there. <laughs> I'm being affectionate with it. I think that's my friend's cousin. <laughs> you know Danny. Yeah. 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 All right. So let's escape from there. We don't need to look at that stuff anymore. Um, oops. Let's move this down. All right. All right. We're back again. All right, let's move into whiskey number two while we share a little bit more. You guys have seen the Before we do, let's just, for those of you who, are, it is their first tasting. So I have a couple of you on the chats say it's your first. So um, as it is your first whiskey, uh, how is it in the chats? Or if you want to unmute yourself, raise your hand. How is the first whiskey? How did you like it? Uh, being cask strength, what was that experience like for you? It's a good call. while they take a sec to respond, Harmony. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about that one for the first one in the lineup? It was really light, um, even at 52. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of heat, but yeah, lots of honey, lots of syrups, a little bit of oaky note. Um, I added a few drops of water and it made it really syrupy, um, which is interesting. It makes it thinner, but it feels more viscous. Um, all of these uh, whiskeys are from Scotland. And uh, yeah, Greg said a few drops really smoothed it out for him. And if you were talking whiskey regions, this is a lowland whiskey. Um, Strathclyde is in Glasgow, Glasgow and Edinburgh, both some in the lowlands and stuff. Uh, the regions we'll talk about a little bit tonight, I think. Um, they don't really mean much anymore, to be totally honest with you. But yeah. Especially because they change, <laughs> get new ones. Yeah, and we'll. This is where we'll share a little bit of geekiness because if you can take away a few stories to share with your friends, that's a cool thing too. So we'll come to that. Um, yeah, I, I am. I agree with you. I think it's actually quite soft on the palate. Um, old grain whiskeys can be lovely. Sorry, I'm being attacked by two cats here right now. Um, old, <laughs> old grain whiskeys can be quite lovely. Um, again, I always look for that kind of pancakey and syrupy you note know, going on. There's a little bit of like oval team for me and a slight, slight orangey sort of note on the two. I do get orange on the nose. Not sure if I picked it up on the palate. Palate is more spice driven, a little bit drier, 
it's a it's a little bit grippy and a little bit hot on the palate than um, than the nose inside, anyways. Yeah. 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 Nice. I like that one. So this stuff, believe it or not, would have come off the stills at ninety four and a half percent. It would have been cast at sixty three and a half percent. That's what most in the industry use. Um, it was pretty universal for a while because it allowed fair trading with the distilleries and blenders that traded. They knew they were trading like for like if all the whiskey had gone into the barrel at the same strength. So that became sort of the, the trading strength, if you will. Um, in this case, because they only probably wanted it to be around 40% initially, it would have all been cask at 63 and a half, let to do whatever it did. It would have watered it down to whatever they needed for blending purposes. However, this whiskey did not have that destiny. It didn't end up with Chivas. They sold the barrel, as Harmony said, to Cooper's Choice. And I think we're lucky because these sorts of whiskeys, there's no such thing as regular strapped clies on the market. There's no brand for strapped cly. So the only way we ever get to try whiskeys like this is through uh, a company called Cooper's Choice in this case. We'll talk about a couple others and stuff in the back end, but I like that one. Yeah. Don't die with the tasting notes either. I see David said, I liked a few drops of water added to the mix, but seems to lack complexity. I think, I think that uh, you'll see that complexity get deeper on the next one and a much, much deeper on the third as we go into three different styles back to back to back. Yeah, well, you've got your complexity, David. Don't you worry. It's in here. <laughs> All right. Let's do number two. Johnny Walker Celebratory Blend. So uh, as Kurt mentioned, this is a blended whiskey. So a blend of single malts and single grains blended together, it's blended. blended. Yeah. yeah. It's Johnny Walker. And it's uh, Johnny Walker. I, okay, confession, um, and I always get in trouble for wearing my biases on my sleeve. Um, you know, when you work in the environment we work in, um, sometimes you have to suspend your passions a little bit just to try to remain slightly objective. But the flip side of that is I don't work for a brand. I work for every brand. I can sell whatever I want. And if I think something's good, I want to share that, right? Um, Johnny Walker is the biggest Scotch whiskey in the world. There's nothing even close. Diageo owns it. it it's massive. You can't even imagine the volume they pump out of this stuff. Johnny Walker is also producing, or Diageo under the Johnny Walker name is producing some of the best whiskey. I unequivocally keep a bottle of the black label on my shelf all the time. One of the best blends on the market. Mm -hmm. Beautifully caramely with a nice smokiness through it and really nice fruit threads. But there's nothing younger than 12 years in that, which is really cool too. Um, and for 55 bucks or whatever you can get it for, it's an opening. Red label, on the other hand, don't even do that to your enemies. Please don't. Desperation <laughs> measure on an airplane. If you really want whiskey and all they have is red label, drink red. Red label is rough. Save your money, buy black label. Uh, from there, green, gold, whatever, they all have different stories. They all have different things. But uh, blue can be a little disappointing for the price point you pay. But it's still fantastically made whiskey. I'll die on this hill. I swear to God, Johnny Walker is exciting. Um, this is one I, like I said, I didn't, uh, I didn't know if I tried all the ones tonight. And I know I haven't had this whiskey. So I'm pretty excited for this one. Do you know much about it, Harmony? No. No. I don't. It's great. So much richer. Um, a whiskey like this, I don't think right off the bat I would guess blended. And that might just be um, context because we came out of a grain. If I was comparing this to a malt, maybe I would say it smells blended. But one, the 51% alcohol really, really helps. We're not dealing with what is typically a 40% watered down blend. It's got a little bit more oomph and a little bit more body. Um, there's a real important reason for that. And we're gonna come to that really, really shortly here. Um, but this is a fruit bomb with a nice bit of smokiness behind it. Yeah, I get like lots of like raisin and kind of candied spices on the on the nose here, like sweet, sweet dried fruit. A nice gingery kind of peppery sort of note going on with it too. Marmalade, orange zest or something. Tobacco. My like less nostrils get nothing. I'm only getting one side of my senses here. Okay, on the palate, it comes across a little bit more like a blend. 
comes across a little bit leathery. So you can tell there's a little bit of heat in it, a little bit of earthiness and a little bit of smokiness coming across on the palate. A little bit dry. Dry for sure. Almost tastes a little bit like an Ardmore style, but they don't own Ardmore. It's kind of weird. That's a fantastic palate. Mm. It's a little ashier than I expected. Yeah, I get lots of pepper. Like the finish is like all pepper. Mm. Feel free to share your notes. Um, some of you guys, if you've been around for a little while, um, before I go there, David says, can you describe dry? Um, it's literally a, the, the sensation of drying. Um, whiskeys can have tannins in them. Uh, so I guarantee you this blend is gonna have some sherry casks in it, uh, possibly some wine casks even. Um, those casks are still gonna hold some of that dry tannic wine influence. Um, but even when they're entirely ex bourbon, you can still have that sort of drying feeling. Typically it starts on the back and sides of the tongue and just feels like your mouth is kind of drying out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You said in the chat, not like, wines dry but it is like wine dries like you feel the tannins mm -hmm. of like fruit almost you feel the tannins of the wood and if there is wine casks you feel the tannins of the wines um and sometimes uh other people have described it to me um without the nutty flavor but that dryness of like walnuts if you're mm -hmm. if you're used to that more of a, a descriptor than the wine side like just dry you're not salivating sweetness at the front of your palate tea but tea will do that too sometimes yeah tea does it too yeah paul had a great comment he said there must be a good amount of talus green here. I uh, if there's some rabbit holes we fall down tonight guys i'm really sorry uh yes diageo is talisker and yes it ends up in a lot of blends that they produce or blending mm -hmm. all green label and stuff I would absolutely bet there's Talisker. And that's probably that peppery coming up again. Yeah, and now that you say that, we did the Talisker storm last week and I get a little bit of that, yeah. Ozone-y, um, slightly saline. Yeah, like slightly salty, peppery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so with those tasty notes, some of you that have been around for a while, um, I know this is an intro to whiskey. I know there's some people here that aren't. Um, exactly introductory and we're probably just hoping for some great drinks. Hopefully we can get that thing too. Um, but there was a couple here that worked in the city. They got in some legal trouble a little while ago. I won't get into that whole story, but he did share a real nugget many, 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 many years ago. Uh, I remember being at a tasting and he was trying to get people to engage and share some tasting notes. And everybody's shy, of course, because, you know, you feel like you're you're going to be mocked if you say it smells like potpourri or something like that, right? Everybody's got to be a tough guy when you're drinking this. Um, whiskey is made from water, yeast, and barley. That's it. That's it. So no matter who the whiskey expert is that you're reading, whether it's Jim Murray, um, Charles McLean, um, Ruben, or Dom, or whomever it might be, if you're reading reviews online, anything, or when we're throwing out tasting notes, we can't possibly be right and we can't possibly be wrong mm -hmm. because it's not there. What is happening though is you're getting chemical analogs. We are getting some of the same flavor compounds, the esters, the um, aldehydes, all that kind of stuff that exist in those foods and those smells and stuff that we know. We're picking up those similarities. Um, so there is no right and wrong. There really isn't. So don't be shy with your tasting notes. Water, yeast, and barley. That's all it comes down to. And I love the honesty of tasting notes. Uh, it really, you learn about people from their tasting notes. Um, you learn about what they like to eat or drink. You learn about where they've been or where they're from. Um, and I, I just- really biographical. I hadn't really thought of it that way. That's really true. It's so true. Like, um, like I'm not, I don't eat a lot of like Asian food. And when people are like, oh yeah, there's a lot of like un unami flavors. I'm like, what, what is that? Like, I'm, I'm not used to that. Or it's like, oh, it tastes like this type of honey that I had when I go back home uh, right. to England that my grandma used to make and like honey biscuits. I'm like, oh, I wish we had those bees here, <laughs> like, but we'll never have those flowers. So I won't know that taste, that experience. And I remember watching a, like a Lafroy video. She's like, oh, it smells like a wet cow on a bog. And it's like, how can you not smile? Um, even if you hate it, how can you not smile at some of these notes? 
So I think I think Harmony and I are both kind of fly by the seat of our pants kind of gals. So this team may get adjusted as we go because I'm going to jump into something now that I, we were going to talk about a little bit later. Um, so we'll just keep bumping topics back and let you guys throw questions at us and stuff too. Um, tasting notes. When you hear people throwing out tasting notes, or like Harmony says, it's biographical in that sense of what she's, what she's leading us to. You, you're not going to be an expert at tasting notes, right? And I think everybody looks for all those nuances that people are getting. Don't do that. If you want to take your own tasting notes, if you want to start to learn how to suss whiskeys out a little bit, come at it gently and move away and do it a couple times. Pick up whatever you're picking up and then just go, what does that actually remind me of? What do I think of? And if you go, oh yeah, it kind of smells like my, like going to my grandparents' place when I was young. Why? Because grandma was always baking. What was grandma baking? She always made cinnamon buns. Says, oh yeah, I kind of get a note of cinnamon bun. Right? Let your mind do some wandering. It'll take you there. But just ask what it makes you think of or where it takes you to, first of all. Second of all, if you want to start to recognize more of those smells, when you're at the grocery store, I know we're in the age of COVID. This, I'm not talking COVID times. <laughs> no, no, that go to the bulk barn stick your nose in those bins it's hard now i get that you can but, through masks <laughs> yeah, i i'm not kidding i used to go to those bulk bins and stuff and you know go out to okotoks years and years ago or wherever and just pop open all those bins you know there's chinese five spice what does that actually smell like there's nutmeg like raw nutmeg you know what does that smell like um it's incredible how you can pick those up yeah well, we're getting some honesty on the chat here, which I love, some transparency. Andrew smells acetone in number three, and I'm getting butterscotch. Yeah, number so three. I love it. Um, and you might notice, too, as you start allowing yourself to express your, your smell, I'm like, what, where your mind is going. If you go back now and smell number one, it might smell completely different than than when you first experienced it, which is why we've said, save a little bit in your glass. Cause as we go back, it's gonna evolve, it's gonna change. Um, and that evolution is also what I, I look forward to when I, I commit to buying a full size bottle too. Like day one, when I try it, the you know, week later, a month later, like how is it evolving? Agreed. Yeah. So, sorry, go ahead. Honey. No, I was just gonna, I was gonna say to that note, whiskey, does not age in its bottle. So when it's bottled at 25 years, it's it's always 25 years. It doesn't matter how long you keep it tucked away in your cupboard, but um, but the amount of oxidization that you allow it will um, allow the whiskey to change. Mm, that's yeah. so. <laughs> um, yeah. So before we move on to, I mean, our third whiskey and we can absolutely nose, start nosing our third whiskey. Um, well, when we talk about blended whiskey, Kurt, I'm just going to ask a, an ignorant question for those who might be feeling the same way. You blend whiskeys to make a blended whiskey. Do you blend the regions as well? And does it matter? So I was going to hint at it earlier when we talked about types of whiskey. Mm -hmm. We've got malt whiskey, we've got blends is the ones most people know, right? right? Single grains like that Strathclyde we had, we don't see too many of them until you get into the whiskey geeky side of things. Unless you're through the airport and you get sucked into, oh my God, that's David Beckham's bottle of Hag Club. Don't buy it. Please do not buy it. It's gone off. Don't buy it. <laughs> uh, horrible young grain whiskey. Um, it's a pretty bottle. Yeah. <laughs> then you have, you have, um, blended malts where it's not a single malt anymore but you're not going to use any cheap grain either but you do want to marry together a few nice single malts um this is what john glazer from compass box does which we don't have any compass box here tonight john glazer basically works like a jeweler he'll pick there you go he'll pick one amazing parcel of whiskey and a few smaller ones and he'll kind of use that main one as his shining stone his diamond or his you know his big showcase stone and then he'll use a few other pieces around it that accent or highlight or tweak it a little bit um that's typically what a blended malt is it can be so much more than some of its parts you can take something that's already great and tweak it a little bit just like you would add salt and pepper to the meal um you can also have blended grains 
which no malt at all, just grains married together. That's what compass box heating is in this case. So in those cases where you're blending whiskeys like that, just all malts or whatever, almost certainly you're gonna to have to blend from different regions. So a blend is not regional based in any way, shape or form, unless they want it to be. Black Bottle was infamous for a while for being built on all the Isla malts. Um, it no longer is the case, but typically blends are gonna be from all over, just building the cool thing. Right on. Um, so now we've mentioned regions. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, there are five, five Scotch regions. What are they, Kurt? Speed round. Highlands, Lowlands, Isla, Speyside, and Campbellton. Same the best sort of some okay. sub regions, like they used to count the islands sort of separately and stuff, but all that stuff was nonsense. I've been hearing that a lot as well, that the islands are the new region. Uh, and I, I joked that, you know, every 10 years, we don't have to come up with a new region. <laughs> we can just let it be. Um, it is, the islands are unique in their own way. And so as, as distilleries, um, you know, get known and get established, they're going to have their own characteristics and their own fan followings, but to give them their own designations, I don't think it's necessary. Yeah. So let's, Let's introduce the next one and talk about the next one for a sec and come right back to that because this is a bigger topic and this was going to be our dram two topic before we started looking at some other stuff there too, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Daft Mill, uh, this is definitely a distillery that is not in every liquor store. Uh, in fact, I think it is only in uh, like Kensington's liquor stores right now. I think so, so far. Um, <laughs> this is one that's near and dear to my heart. I love the Daft Mill story and I love the Daft Mill whiskey already. Um, I think the reason I pushed you to jump in here is just because I don't want some of these comments to get lost. We're getting some, um, a note saying number one is like isopropyl, isopropanol um, and Andrew gets incense. The isopropanol is because it is just essentially they're creating a high alcohol neutral grain spirit. It's like hand sanitizer. Aged yeah. in <laughs> Shh, I didn't say that, right? Um, so that totally <laughs> makes sense. Um, and number three on the palate, like a fermenting wine room. Absolutely. And this makes sense for a reason. Um, you've started to enter that tangy fruit category here with whiskeys that have, have been allowed to age for a fair amount of time with the complexity of a malt profile. When you have a single malt, you, you added yeast to your wort, as we talked about, and it created a beer. Think about beer. Think about you get those funky Belgian beers, those lambics that are all tangy and tart and everything. You get tropical sorts of IPAs and stuff. The beer makers are chasing cool yeast strains and stuff, trying to make things unique and funky and all that kind of stuff. If whiskey distillation is taking your base product and distilling to get to the essence of it, if you want good whiskey, you have to have a good beer to start with. Now, if you want a good beer, you're looking for something that's kind of characterful, probably fruity, kind of funky, something that has no flaws on either end, those four shots and the faints we looked at. You want a nice spirit run, and then you got to put it into good wood and manage it properly. That's why I'm so lit up about Daft Mill, and that's probably why I'm starting to talk faster. Um, Daft Mill, these guys were founded in 2005 in the Lowlands. The Lowlands, which, when regions really, really mattered, was known for light, floral, triple distilled, easy going whiskeys. Lowlands aren't necessarily that, but they've also gone through a bit of a contraction over the past however many years. Daft Mill was created with an eye to producing this light lowland style, um, but they're kind of not really. It's, it's light enough, it's easy enough, but it's got some body to it. It's got some heft to it. Like, yeah, you're gonna get it on the palate, but you're also gonna get it on the nose. You can tell it's robust, right? Yeah. So we just went from higher strengths, but when I put my nose in this, it's like, oh, that's so much richer. Like, look what you've got here. The yeah. reason I love Daft Mill, the reason I'm so passionate, these guys started distilling in 2005. It's a tiny little farm. Ian and Francis Cuthbert, the brothers run it. They don't need to distill. It was literally, what else can we do on the farm? They only distill on the shoulder months of farming season, just a few months a year. They put maybe a hundred barrels away a year compared to the big brands that are putting away thousands a week. Like, you know, it's unbelievable. 
the tiny little amount of daffodil that was produced, the whiskey world was salivating for it, going, holy crap, how do we get this? How do we get this? How do we get this? Auction prices are through the roof for the first releases. The Cuthbert brothers refused to release the whiskey until it was like 10 years old. They could have released it at three and sold it for a fortune. They refused. They said, it's not ready. It's not good enough. Because they didn't need the money. They didn't give a shit. All they wanted to do was make sure they were producing brilliant whiskey. So we're looking at a 2008 vintage, which is one of the first Daft Mills that's ever been released. That is incredible to me, the integrity behind a brand like that. I absolutely love it. And the whiskey, let's leave this to you guys to throw your notes up there. We already had a few. Um, David says, I love the Daft Mill Mills. Unique to everything I've previously tried. Brand new, they're doing things cool and interesting, right? Um, and leaning towards that dried apricot note that Elena was getting, I totally get that. That big fruitiness there is awesome. Mm -hmm. Berry and green apples. I'm absolutely getting the cherry notes, almost to me like those cherry twist candies. Um, all of that is the main reason I'm here at Daft Mill is awesome, says Paul. And I'm with Paul on this one. What <laughs> a nose. That nose is so cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of Play-Doh behind it. I think that's that maltiness of the barley where you've got that like flowery, salty kind of note to it. Mm. I don't remember the last time I played with Play-Doh. <laughs> Play-Doh is a great analogy for blending folks. I use this in the store and forgive me if any of you have been in to see me and I've given you this one already. Um, when people want to talk about, you know, single casks versus mainstream big battings and all that kind of stuff, the analogy I always give, you get something that's really, really small batch, like this Daft Mill, with only a couple casks married together, or when you get a single cask whiskey, that's all the highlights, right? They're picking the highlights to give you. When you've got a brand, and this is not a knock against them, hear me out, like Glenn Fittick, who have to release a 12-year-old, that's their staple whiskey. But every batch they do has to be the same, it has to be consistent, and they have to produce millions of bottles of it. So they're batting together thousands of casks for every batting they do of that whiskey. Here's the Play-Doh analogy. Put a little kid at the table, give them 10 different colors of Play-Doh, and leave them alone for 10 minutes. I'll bet you when you come back, there's a big brown pile in the middle of that table. <laughs> now, when you marry a whole bunch of casks together, they're highs and lows and all over the place. Yeah, you might be able to hide some of the flaws in any of the shoddier casks, but you also bury the high notes from the best of the casks. So you end up with a consistent flavor profile. It's probably really good, and you aim to make that really good. And they've done that at Glenfiddich and such, but you've lost all the highest notes. So to me, these little small batch bottlings like this are really, really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, has a bit of tonnage warehouse on the nose. I think, on the nose, I think he's talking about that now. Yeah. Um, Suzanne asked, what type of casks is this whiskey aged in? And uh, this one is 100% ex bourbon. Yeah. This was, only, was this the one, Harmony, that was? Do you have the information in front of you there? Mm -hmm. I meant yeah. to share it. Why don't I try screen sharing that one too? And see if we can have some cooperation here on this. Oh, we'll yeah. come back to the others if they want to see it. Um, let's see if this works real quick. Always got to cross my fingers when we're doing this because it just never seems to want to cooperate. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Cool. Um, so 6,000 bottles in the world. Um, I can't stress how little that is in the whiskey world where collectors have scooped up every drop of cool stuff. Um, Super, super scarce. Like I said, these bottles, even though they're only 10, 12 year old whiskey in most cases, are driving collectors crazy. The auction prices are going nuts for any of them. So this one is in fact 12 years old. And as Harmony says, it's all ex bourbon. So ex bourbon barrels, think of it this way. If you've tried bourbon, try to look for the influence of bourbon on the spirit. What is bourbon to the group? It's really sweet, it's really spicy. Do you get some of that on this? To me, bourbon's always a little bit cherry-ish. We got notes of cherry, somebody mentioned early -ish, or earlier. Um, dunnage, there's some kind of toasty cask notes there. Those are all hallmarks of bourbon. So you can kind of see the cask in there. Yeah. Other tasty notes, Paul says sweet, creamy mouthfeel, fruity and vanilla, and Greg says bubblegum. 
uh, vanilla ice cream. Totally, all those things. It's beautiful whiskey. Great, great spiciness. Um, what is Dunnage again? Um, Dunnage is, when we refer to Dunnage warehouses, they tend to be these old buildings, they're 100 years old, 200 years old, even older in a lot of cases. It's dirt floors, it's old wood, and it's spirit in old wood. So the Dunnage warehouses tend to have this old, musty, dirty, old wood kind of note to it. As much as I'm not romancing it, it's a beautiful smell. <laughs> um, Dunnage typically, you know, if you've worked in shops and stuff, is generally just used to speak about scraps of wood that are used to prop things so they won't roll. So a Dunnage warehouse is literally where you put all these barrels on these, you know, stretches of wood, four by fours, whatever you want to use, and use blocks of wood to put those barrels in place. Just line them all up on there, shove a couple of chunks of wood in there, and it's going to hold it in place. Yeah, old barn taste, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's so many whiskey notes that can be summed up through experiential relationships like that better than any tasting note I can ever give you. So somebody that goes, oh man, it's kind of like, you know, when you have, um, <laughs> you're gonna laugh some of you, Brooklady is infamous for its lactic character. Um, and you pick it up really on the heavily peated whiskeys and stuff too. The easiest way to describe that note to anybody is to say it kind of smells like baby puke. Um, <laughs> Baby puke is not that gross. It's nothing but milk and just a little bit of sour. Right? Sour. Yeah, we're not talking adult nastiness here or anything like that. Um, so those little things you can do to make it relatable make it so much more interesting in the whiskey world. It kind of makes it so we all speak the same language as opposed to reading a bunch of tasty notes where some wankers talking about quince and, you know, clotted cream and whatever else like we tend to do. We all do in the whiskey side of things. But the reviews, the... Uh, the dialogue is always more exciting when it's just related to something and people can relate to that. That's way more fun. Yeah, like it smells like the country fair, you know, like candy mm. apples, cotton candy, and those, you know, candy corns. Like that we are drunk uncles. Lactic, no, no. <laughs> All right. So um, while we're kind of sipping away on that one, um, let's kind of dig a little deeper into um, the regions, a little bit what's behind that side of things. And then we'll talk about casks really quickly before going into the next one. Um, regions were really, really key for quite some time. Um, it helped the blenders primarily. They knew where they were sourcing whiskeys from, what kind of flavor profiles they could be expected to have. And the distilleries geared themselves in that fashion. The Isla whiskeys were all, you know, really, really smoky, peaty, earthy, beach bonfire, coal smoky, tarry, all of those kind of things, right? Um, Speyside tended to be stone fruits and apples and pears and red berries and stuff, a bit of spice in kind of. The highlands tended to be kind of more coastal, maybe salty, maybe heathery, floral, um, not necessarily as much on the fruits that you get in the Speyside, but still some of that fruitiness as well. The lowlands tend to be lighter in style, triple distilled, a little more fragrant, a little more floral and lighter typically. And Campbellton, Campbellton was a train wreck, if I'm being honest. Campbellton at one point was the whiskey capital of the world with 32 distilleries and this tiny little Mulligan tire that uh, Rod Stewart sung about all those years back. Um, the demand for Campbellton whiskeys was so extreme at one point, they said they were putting it into anything. Like there was rumors of it going, whiskey going into herring barrels teacher. I'm sure that's bullshit. I'm sure that's all apocryphal nonsense that we love to just tell and regurgitate in these settings. Um, but the reality is Campbellton whiskey from that point all the way through has always had this weird oily funk. That's how we describe Campbellton whiskeys. They're funky. They have a funk. It's weirdly sour, tangy, fruity, dirty, oily, industrial at the same time, kind of smoky, very coastal. Just an absolute wreck. Now, having said that, having kind of told you what all those regions should mean, almost none of them mean anything anymore. Mm -hmm. Every distillery out there that has a, a brain in their head, so to speak, has hedged their bets. The whiskey industry has been subject to more booms and busts than we care to imagine. The last one was horrendous in the 80s. 
uh, late 70s and 80s, we blame disco, we blame cocktail, Studio 54, you know, all that kind of stuff, largely because we like to pick on disco and stuff. Uh, but people wanted cocktails. They didn't want the brown spirits. They didn't want the stuffiness anymore. And we ended up with what we call the whiskey lock. Lock is in body of water or body of liquid kind of thing. Um, nobody was buying it. So all these distilleries were sitting on more whiskey than you can imagine. It ended up being great for whiskey drinkers for a few years, but it meant the closure of loads of distilleries. Lots of stuff was lost, um, sadly. Um, so in order to not end up surplus to requirements, like a lot of those distilleries did that produced in a certain style, most distilleries are now going, okay, most of what we produce is unpeated, but let's do peated production for a couple months a year. So we've got some of that in our warehouse. Maybe the blenders will want that if things go so. We've got things to trade. You can sell it to the independent bottlers. They're going to want all sorts of styles. Loch Lomond, for example, Harmony, I'm sure is very familiar with Loch Lomond. They have pot stills. They have a Lomond still. They have column stills. They can produce grain whiskeys, all sorts of malt whiskeys. They can actually do in-house blends. It's the only distillery that can do that. I think that's super, super cool. So those regions, if you're going into a liquor store and going, oh, I really like space side whiskeys, don't, don't, don't worry about the regions worry about the things that excite you, get, you know, find a, a whiskey that looks like it's interesting, check out some of the tasting notes for it and go that direction. Don't get hung on a region because it, it's probably going to steer you wrong now. It's going to steer you right. Um, cast types. Harmony, let's talk about casks before we move on to number four. Or do we want to start number four while we talk about casks? Let's, I know some of uh, some of you have started nosing number four, so let's just nose it. Um, and as we nose it, let's think about the cask. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm so excited to be revisiting this one. I love Anok whiskey. Um, and I all, I have loved it for years. And I've, I've had so many people tell me they don't love it, which is absolutely fine with me because then I don't have to worry about a shortage. Uh, <laughs> um, Here's a little trick for you. I saw you do it. Uh, not yet, you haven't. <laughs> um, I do this in the shop a lot of times when we can pour samples. Unfortunately, we can't right now. Um, when we pour you a little taste, we're only going to pour you a little bit. When we do a tasting like this, we only have a little bit in our glass. So we do the best we can to get most aroma off this little bit of whiskey we can. But the best thing you can do is increase the surface area to give yourself more to nose off of, right? So if you've got a glass where the lip of it isn't too wide, you've got a nose in glass or some nose in glasses, play along with me. Cover that glass tight, put your whiskey in it and shake the hell out of it like you're mad at it. Let it drip off for a sec. Okay, let your whiskey sit for a moment. You've now coated the entirety of that glass. So it's gonna release a lot of ethanol right off the bat. So if you stick your nose right in it, it's gonna be holy crap. The other thing, see what Harmony just did, rub your hands together, give them a little bit of heat, give them a little bit of warmth. So once they start to heat up a little bit and dry, smell your hands. I guarantee one of the biggest things you're gonna smell is a little bit of wood spice, but primarily you're gonna smell them kind of malted barley cereal sort of notes all over your hands. That's the grain start showing through there. Mm -hmm. Okay, now your whiskey should give so much more intensity of flavor, aroma, I should say, at this point. There's so much cool stuff going on. That's like the alcoholized fruit syrup of, out of like um, fruit cocktail, the cherry heavy cone. Mm -hmm. Baked apple, vanilla ice cream, heather honey, great notes. And if you're looking at your label, Harmony said it perfectly accurate. Gallic is a horrible language. It's really, really mean to you as a beginner beginning whiskey drinker. This distillery is actually called Nokdu. Uh, there was some confusion with another distillery called Nokendo. So instead of releasing Nokdu, they renamed their brand Anok, just to make it even more confusing. Um, but when you look at the whiskey, it looks like it says Anknok. Um, that big C, the capital C, as they've stylized their writing, um, is actually silent, it's Anok. This was a limited release they did to celebrate the 125th of the anniversary. When the agents came through the shop a couple of years ago, um, they poured us on a range of 
Yeah, whiskeys and a couple others. I think Bal Blair maybe or something. I think that was in the same stables. Bal Blair, Paul Mooney, et cetera. Um, when it came to this whiskey, Evan, the other guy who um, is kind of key on our whiskey side, there's one or two others. Um, Evan and I kind of looked at each other and went, holy cow, how much of this can we have? Um, it was an Anarch like we weren't used to seeing. It was richer and bigger. And I'm an Anarch fan, just like, like Harmony is. There was something about this that was so beautiful at that 56.3%. Um, it's so fruity. It's so elegant. You can see what 16 years have done here. It's taken it deeper and richer than anything we've had so far in this lineup now, um, largely because you've given enough time in wood to let the wood rise up with rich spices, but also to allow that spirit to oxidize to the point where those esters are being converted into something a little bit different. You've allowed a softening of that spirit. 16 years means, I don't know how many of you guys have heard this expression. You, fill, you filled your cast all the way to the top and then you bind it really tight. That cask is still not airtight. They refer to it as the angel share that's evaporating through that wood and disappearing, right? Kentucky often they call it the devil's cup, but in Scotland, it's always the angel share. Um, you're basically, what's happening is displacement. The whiskey evaporates and oxygen needs to fill that. So that cumulative oxidative effect over 16 long years is stripping away some of the harsher notes. So is the cask. That cask is toasted inside and it's charred inside. The toasting is for flavor, for crystallizing all the natural aniline's in the wood and caramelizing all the sugars in the wood. And it's also the, the, the charring is creating a filter, a charcoal filter. It's helping stripping out impurities in this. So 16 years in a filtration type system, a flavoring type system like this, can give you something that to me is one of my favorite whiskeys of the last two years. So I was just excited to have this in the lineup. So I'm glad we get to do it tonight. So yeah. Thanks. <laughs> That's the beauty of uh, doing these events is we get to pick what we want. Um, and then, you know, pray that it's in stock um, down the road when we actually do an event. Um, Kurt was talking about the wood and how how it breathes, like how it how it begins to how it finishes. Um, and he mentioned the word char. So just to show you to start off, we, we start with a piece of wood that looks like this. Um, I hope you can see it. Um, it's just a block of wood that gets cut into staves that gets stacked together to form a barrel, put a ring on it, there you go. Um, but in order for this wood to interact with the whiskey, it must be charred. And that very simply is uh, causing a fire to, to cook the wood. Um, and you end up with something dark and black like this on the inside. And then you put your whiskey in the barrel and then they interact. Now I've heard of the angel share, of course. Um, I've heard the devil share from Kentucky is uh, used uh, in relation to when the liquid gets absorbed into the wood and, mm -hmm. versus the angel share, which is caused through evaporation. Interesting. Yeah, so two factors. So this one you can see can you see that, Kurt? There's like a distinct gradations. Yeah. Gradation. So you can see where the liquid um, absorbed into the, the grains of the wood. Mm -hmm. And this is a bourbon cask, uh, bourbon barrel, if you would, versus this one here is a sherry, a sherry cask. And it's it's quite a bit darker. I'm not sure if you can really tell, I'm doing my best here, but the wood is much darker, the grains are much darker, the stave is darker, and that's because it held sherry wine. So um, the liquid in it was, was darker, it was red, it colored the wood. Um, and then there's a whole new process that they're doing now with these wine casks, which is the STR cast, uh, STR they call it. You might see it on some labels. And that just means they're taking a barrel uh, cask like this, shaving down that inner wood and giving it a retoasting that caramelizes those pre existing wine notes and those sugars in the wood and just adds a new depth of flavor um, potential for the spirit going in. It's, it to me saves whiskeys that are matured in wine casks so <laughs> it, it can yeah for sure I mean I am a wine drinker so I enjoy the wine cask experience I'm um, but not not all whiskey is equal that is for sure and in all things so um, I'm traditionally a bourbon 
bourbon fan when it comes to my my cast i prefer to eat more classic scotch but i do love um, the excitement of a wine finish there yeah. um this one it's 56.3 so it's pretty pretty robust um when it comes to whiskeys like this folks drink your whiskeys however you want if you want to add a little bit of water and see what it does do it i would caution just add a few drops at a time um, there is no sound science for this. I can't give you a reason or a rationale, but trust me on it. Once a whiskey dies, you can't bring it back to life. <laughs> so if you add too much water to your whiskey, we refer to it as drowning your whiskey. If you add more whiskey back into that glass, it's already mostly water with whiskey. It doesn't reconstitute for some reason. It doesn't seem to work. Mm -hmm. You've broken the whiskey. I don't know why. I can't wrap my head around it. Scientifically, it does not seem sound at all. But it's 100% true. You can't rebuild your whiskey. So add a few drops, see if it softens up to a point where you like it. There's no shame in adding water to whiskey. There's an expression, no self-respecting Scott takes his whiskey with that water. I call BS because I generally don't accepting certain circumstances. So we're going to come to a bunch of questions at the back end. I won't get into all my preferences right now. That's not for you guys, unless you want to hear stories. Uh, but we'll leave that towards the back end. Um, this one... I love this Anok, super cool. But I think we should maybe touch on casks a little bit more before we move to the next one, yeah? Sure. Um, casks in Scotland, about probably about 90% of what's there, just under 90, um, is ex-bourbon barrels. In the US, in order to be bourbon, a barrel has to be virgin oak every single time. So once it's been used once in the States, unless they're making other styles of whiskey, that barrel is no good. So those barrels are sold over to Scotland. Typically, they, they used to be flat pack. Now I think transport's a little bit quicker, so I don't think they're always broken down. Oftentimes they're broken down, shipped out, and then reconstituted when they get them. When they rebuild those bourbon barrels in Scotland, or if those barrels were left intact, it's a 200 liter barrel made from white oak, American oak, Quercus alba. If those barrels aren't quite what they're looking for, they'll often add a few more staves, bigger rings, they'll fatten them up, make them 250 liter barrels, and they call them hogsheads then. Hogsheads basically have taken a bourbon barrel, introduced a little bit more wood, made them a little bit fatter, and now you have a slightly different spirit to wood ratio. Just tweaked it a little bit. The other main one is X Sherry Butts. Uh, but is a 500 liter barrel, so two hogsheads essentially, give or take. Um, there's a lot of ex sherry in the whiskey world. That's where we get those deep red colors typically. Uh, brands like McAllen and such have made their name on their sherry cask work. Um, and then there's also a small portion of ex wine casks and virgin oak casks that have never held any spirit whatsoever. Um, those cask types are key depending on what the flavor profiles we're looking for. And most brands, most distilleries are going to have some of all of them in their houses. Recently, regulations changed. In fact, at Kensington, we have, um, we have a Kilhoman that has been finished in an ex Mezcal cask. Um, we have had Armagnac finished whiskeys. We have a fantastic teal and it's Armagnac finished right now. Um, and we've seen some Calvados finished whiskeys as well. So there's some really neat stuff out there if you're brave and you want to try some new stuff. All right. Now, we just said the second biggest cask type was probably X Sherry. Sorry, was there a question, Elena? Uh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to move on to the next one, but if you're not, that's fine. Um, yeah, yeah. I just had a question about um, Anak and the different types of bottles they make, because right. I bought a bottle for a friend. I don't remember the details. It was a couple of years ago, uh, but I remember it was a special edition. I had bought it at Crowfoot Wines and I, I walked in and I was like, he likes scotch. Pick out something in a reasonable price point for me. <laughs> I think I paid like 80, 90 bucks. It wasn't a super expensive one, um, but it, it was a lot more smoky and what I think is supposed to be peaty. And then I bought a 12 year Anop for myself because I really liked that bottle, but I wasn't able to find it again. And it, they were so different. Um, not that the bottle I bought is terrible, but I was really disappointed because I was hoping to get something similar to what the other one was. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about the difference that, that yeah. could have happened there. 
I know it's really vague, but. No, no, no. no. You said everything <laughs> hey, you were totally, totally dead on. Anarch does two different styles, as we just talked about how these discards were hedging the bets a lot of times. Anarch historically has been unpeated malt. Going back into the 50s and 60s, pretty much every distillery would use some peat to dry their barley because it was just a heat source. That's all you needed back then. It got obviously a lot cheaper with other ways to do it. And people just started sourcing um, all malt ready to go. All they had to do was mill it and go kind of thing. Um, so it was already done for them and largely in just big drums, air drying kind of thing. Anok, a few, well, quite some years back now, probably about 20 years back, I guess, 15, 20 years back, started producing um, decently peated malt at different spec levels as well. Um, generally those bottles are the dark green bottles or black bottles. They come in typically black tins. Um, and those ones that there's cutter, router, flotter, peat, uh, scan. There's so many peat heart um, that they've done an entire peated line at this point. So you'll find peated and unpeated and on. So definitely good to do a little bit of checking into it first. Um, I don't think Anok really kills those peated whiskeys, to be honest. So I love hearing that that was the one that lit you up. Um, I typically love Anok unpeated with a lot more age on it. I have a um, fantastic 35 year old, uh, I picked up the first edition they did. And I have a, a 1975, 39 year old I bought just a year or so ago. We brought it into Kensington, it was about $700. I don't know what happened. It's going, well, it shouldn't have been $700. That was underpriced because it was bottled years before. Uh, it was just legacy stock, but something must have happened. It must have got out somehow because it's now averaging like just shy of three thousand euro on whiskey base, which is kind of oh, so. Now it's a little bit tougher to open, but uh, I'm very curious about that. So either I'm going to trade that or I'm going to drink it, but I won't sell it. It'll just get uh, it'll get consumed by somebody I know. So. Just call Elena when you open it because she's yes. try it. <laughs> old Anna, right? Yeah, Anox a great distillery. Um, Harmony actually had her name on the bottle at work and might still as her choice. She's a big Anox fan too. So. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I used to describe it maybe like I liked it so much. I said the 12 is a great breakfast whiskey and Kurt is like, are you crazy? And I said, no, I could drink that all day. <laughs> breakfast never ends if you drink it all day, right? Yeah. Okay, Kurt. so moving on to the Adelphi. Well, we just talked about those cast tips. Let's do Sherry to Harmony. Let's do it. So Adelphi is another independent bottler that we have um, bottling whiskey for us um, and a distillery I am not familiar with. Uh, I know Kurt is because he says it right. Uh, Tina Nick, uh, I think is how you say it. Um, and it, yes, as you can tell by the color, it is much darker than our previous whiskey. So I am assuming we are 100% sherry cask on this, which begs the question now, what type of sherry cask? I don't want to get too geeky into that because that could be a whole nother class on types of sherry wines, but there are typically four four or five main types of sherry you're going to see, like the two really big ones, Oloroso, Pedro Jimenez, or PX, uh, it might be abbreviated under. Those are your two big ones. Um, and, and the flavor profiles are pretty, pretty noticeable once you start to understand the difference between the two. One has definitely more of a nuttier character than the other, which is typically how I try to weave my th way through guessing what the whiskey might be but ultimately I I don't try to put myself in blind situations too often where I have to look at the answer I just like guessing without knowing <laughs> so it's context helps with that kind of stuff so I'm assuming this is either px or all around so as well px is typically sweeter a lot of people actually pour a little bit of px over in ice cream um, oloroso tends to be a little drier a little nuttier a little more chocolatey so with those hints, you guys can weigh in what you think this one might be. Um, the caution, we just jumped up to 59.4. So we're still climbing. It got a little bit bigger here. And you'll notice the flavor spectrum. It didn't just kind of change gears. We dropped it into reverse. Transmission hit the floor and we put a new engine in it here. This one's entirely different. This is big chocolate. This is jammy fruits. This is like when you get a bag of dried fruits where everything's all oily and sticky and stuff. It's kind of figgy. It's kind of like dried cherries even. Um, those sunripe 
fruit bars. If you crack open a fruit letter or some red fruit bar, there's a lot of that, tobaccos, those kind of things. What are those like sun ripe raisins, those little boxes of raisins you get at Halloween when you're like, ah, oh, whose house did we get these from? Let's avoid them next year. Who am I mad at? <laughs> but secretly, I love them. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't tell my siblings because if you tell your siblings you like something then they disappear right um, Greg says coffee on the nose yes that's fair almost always in whiskeys, chocolate coffee all that stuff yeah yeah Here the food. um I man I can eat raisins and things but to just sit down and snack on raisins I I look at parents that do that to their kids and I'm like you're damaged why are you doing that to your kids <laughs> <laughs> I think Chelsea was saying, um, yeah, like she likes to eat raisins, like on her, like, you know, your aunt's on a log, you know, but like, and same thing. She's like, I don't like celery either. It's just a carrier for the peanut butter. And the raisins are just the healthy excuse to get to the peanut butter. <laughs> I don't need excuses to get to the peanut butter. I'm a sucker. Yeah. I'm an adult. I can just get a spoon and peanut That's butter okay. myself. <laughs> All right. So yeah, Harmony's right. I, I love Tianetic. Um, and this is why the um, independent bottlers are really exciting. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that a little bit because we've mentioned it twice tonight. Mm -hmm. We have the brands that release whiskeys and then we have the independent bottlers that release whiskeys. So the brands, when you go into the store and you see the Lafroy logo and it's on a bunch of bottles or the Glenfiddich logo or that Dalmore stag or whatever it might be, that, that drink, that brand is owned by typically a parent company that probably owns a few others. Chivas, Pernod, Ricard, Diageo, et cetera. Some of them are just independents. There's very few of them. But most of them have several expressions. You're going to recognize them because they actually have a proper logo type and they're very well marketed under their brand. Um, but if you come into a store like Kensington or Willow Park or World of Whiskey or anywhere like that, you'll probably see a bunch of independent bottlings too, where you'll recognize the name of the distillery on the label, but it doesn't look like the rest of what that distillery typically uses. In those cases, we could have, just because I see a name in front of me, Enzo. Enzo could start his own whiskey company, call it Enzo's Malts, and buy casks from all different distilleries in Scotland, throw them in his own warehouse. And when he figures that whiskey is right, that's when he would have it bottled and release it. Or he maybe mix a couple of casks together or something. Um, the brands give you what they want you to understand their distillery's profile is. The independent bottlers are keen to give you cool whiskeys that they've gotten excited about, bought, and have to release to you. They're not necessarily gonna be the same as what the brand thinks their distillery profile should be. That distillery profile is typically driven by a master blender or master distiller on their point who goes, our whiskey should be like this. And he will intentionally that cast or she, in a lot of cases, there's some Rachel Berry, one of my heroes in the whiskey world, um, create some of the best whiskeys going. Um, they'll typically have a vision in mind of what they wanna release, right? And that's what we come to know as Dalmore, for example, or something like that. Um, the independent bottlers, they buy casks and whatever comes out of it, that's what they're going to release. It gives us a chance to see whiskeys that we would never see otherwise. And when you get to a point where um, you're really chasing flavors, you're a junkie for this stuff, maybe you're a Harmony, maybe you're Kurt, maybe you're one of you in this group that is down the rabbit hole already or is falling down the rabbit hole, you start to look for things that are a little outside the mainstream. You want to be able to find new stuff. And that's where the independent bottlers really come through for us. Typically, the whiskeys are completely natural colored. They're unfiltered. They're at the barrel proof they come out at. They're left completely alone, aside from a quick filtration, and then they give it to us. Um, this one is Tianetic. Diageo owns Tianetic again. Um, I believe Diageo owns Tianetic. I might be wrong on that, actually. I don't know if Diageo does own Tianetic. Oh, my Lord. I'm going to shut up now. Um, I think so. <laughs> Big distillery, 10.2 million liters a year they produce that. However, it all ends up blended away. Uh, it is Diageo. Sorry, it is Diageo. Oh, yeah, because that 17 year it came. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a Highland distillery. Almost everything goes into blends or gets sold to some independent bottlers. They do things differently there. Instead of using the typical mill that we saw earlier with those like, big stone rollers that are crushing that barley by rolling together, 
they're using hammer mills and mesh, basically mesh bags to squeeze the wart out of it. They're doing things a little bit differently there. I don't care about that. All I care about what comes across in the bottle. Um, I do care about that, but I don't care about that today. Um, <laughs> what Tianinic though typically has is a beautifully fruity character. Whether it's in ex-bourbon, whether it's in sherry, it doesn't really matter. There are some stunning tianitics on the market and nobody knows to look for it. Shh. This is why these tastings are fun. Hunt for tianitics, hunt for Tormors, hunt for Glen Talkers. These are some fantastic, like stunning distillers that nobody knows about because they're, if they have a main range, it sucks and it's boring, so people avoid it. But through the independent bottlers, there are beautiful, beautiful distillers. Yeah. So, this is an example of a fairly delicate spirit that has some beautiful fruit tones and it's typically used in the blending world. That's what they call a top dressing malt because it gives it nice flavors. In this case, they put it in an X sherry butt that is gonna absolutely overwhelm it for big, dark, rich, fruity kind of flavors. I haven't even tasted this yet. I'm just about to dive in. I think you guys are ahead of me. If it's hot, add a few drops of water. Mm -hmm. Make it comfortable for yourself. Think of whiskey that you get at cask strength as a coffee. Just like when you buy frozen orange juice or whatever else. You can choose how much water you add to that to make your orange juice taste how you want it to be so it's not overly watery. Whiskey is the same. They've given us the concentrate in this case. You can decide how much water. They haven't done the, the water addition for you. This isn't a 40% blend anymore. You get to dilute it if you want. Yeah, and I know a lot of people who are have been into whiskey for a while will say, oh no, don't add water. But I absolutely disagree. Um, it is absolutely your right and your experience to add water or not add water. Um, and maybe on a Monday, you might add a good amount of water. Wednesday, maybe just two drops. And Friday, absolutely nothing because you're going to sit and sip on that for a very, very long time. You're going to allow yourself to just salivate and dilute it naturally and take your time. Um, and so water is not necessary. But the beautiful thing about buying in concentrate, as uh, Kurt said, is that you just get to do it. So if you're buying it at 59% and you want to take it home and water it down to 46, double your bottle, then absolutely go for it. It's yours. If you want to drink it out of a shoe because that's the way you had your first drink, absolutely go for it. <laughs> Hopefully it's a new shoe, but um, it's yours and you can absolutely and should should just enjoy it. Um, judgment. If it's an old shoe, no kink shaming here. We're no we're, anything's good, whatever makes you happy. Everything is good. Yeah. And uh how you whatever you want to drink it out of, if it's you know, like a Glen Karen, uh, you know, highball glass, copita, like there's there's all sorts of things, coffee mug. Um it, it, everything works, just no styrofoam. That's one, get it to your face, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the only thing is no styrofoam. That just doesn't belong. <laughs> when we, we talk about water and whiskey again, um, all I'll say is you're slapping them in the face. Do you know how much work they went to to get that water out of it? <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, by all means, your whiskey should be comfortable to drink. There's no point in drinking it. This isn't a, a measuring contest where you have to say, yeah, I drank it at 64%. That serves nobody any good. Um, <laughs> the blenders, when they're trying to suss up tasting notes for us and stuff for these things, generally are watering them down to 20% to get all the notes they're giving us. We're not gonna get most of those notes because not many of us are ever gonna water our whiskey down to 20% to drink it because we know we want a little bit of heat there. That's what you're looking for in whiskey. You want it to be warm and comforting and all that kind of stuff but 60 percent kind of feels like you're sandblasting your taste buds sometimes so maybe you don't want to say yeah um, um just back to the chat um david said uh sorry elena thick creamy fruit andrew flower almond uh wow definitely a big fruit bomb it's jumped all over my mouth Woo. um now pick up your guitar and lay down some face melting solos, Kurt. Um, and then Elena asks, what's the difference between rye and whiskey? Um, which is a question we are asked probably every day. Uh, and the difference is it is all whiskey. That whiskey is just made with rye grain. So whereas we would say barley, malt, rye grain, corn grain, it's all whiskey. As long as it's distilled and barreled, you did your job. 
Rye typically is going to be made from rye, but in Canada, we cheat a little bit here. We call pretty much everything that's made in Canada rye. We shouldn't, not all of it even contains any rye, let alone entirely rye. That's um, true. Yeah. Uh, the other differentiator, I think, too, here, um, scotch. All scotch is whiskey, not all whiskey is scotch. In Scotland, in the UK, anywhere you go there, um, England, Ireland, Wales, whatever, and probably through a bunch of Europe, too. Um, if you ask for whiskey, they know you're talking about scotch. Scotch is not a term that's generally used there. If you go to a bar on Isla or in Speyside or something and ask for scotch, they know what you're talking about, of course. They're smart. It says scotch whiskey on the labels for most of these things, but the locals aren't going to call it scotch. They ask if you drink whiskey. It's just whiskey over there. Um, lots of different styles of whiskey. That reminds me of, a, I don't know what movie it was. The Rock was in it and the guy's like, hey, do you have any Brazil nuts? And the lady's like, we're in Brazil. They're just called nuts. <laughs> Love it. Mm -hmm. um, so how old were we on that one? That was probably yeah. a 10, 11 year old. It is 10 years. Okay. But so, so much going on, so much depth that it feels older. Let's, um, okay, so one, the darkness of this whiskey and the intensity, intense, intensity of it. First day with my lips, forgive me. Um, we talked about cask types, but it's really, really imperative that we actually talk to how active those casks are too. Uh, we talked about virgin oak. Um, we also talk about first fill barrels. That's the first fill it gets when it goes to Scotland, not the first time it's been filled. So that's, the first time it's been filled with scotch whiskey, but it's probably been used with something else. Mm -hmm. We have second fill, refill, third fill, fourth fill casks. These barrels will get used several times, many times. Some of these barrels are hundred years old. Um, the thing with these whiskeys is you do want the barrel to impart some flavor, but you also want it to be a vessel for oxidation. The more times you use a cask, the less it has to give the whiskey, but it'll still serve as a great vessel. So when you're on fourth fill barrel, it might take 30, 35, 40 years for that whiskey to do. So this whiskey that we just had, this Tiananek, it's insanely intense. It's only a 10-year-old, I think, how many just said? Yeah. That, to me, I don't even know if that barrel was dry when they filled it. I don't even know if it was <laughs> I would guess That's not. A lot of sherry influence, right? <laughs> I, would, I would guess it's a pretty, act, like, fresh, fresh barrel, like probably still a little bit wet, maybe even had some juice still sloshing around in there. Right. But it's delicious. <laughs> unfortunately, um, this whiskey is, however, unfortunately out of stock. Um, so we will unfortunately not be able to revisit this one, um, but it's, it's lovely and I'm happy we got to try it. Uh, before we go to number six, which Elena has a note for that I love there, William says number five got hotter for me adding, after adding water. Interesting. The, um, there's an expression about, you know, water opening up whiskey. Andrew hates that expression and I tend to agree with him. It doesn't necessarily open it up. It's going to change it and it won't necessarily change it for the better. So it's key to always add water a little bit at a time and find it, but like, lead you naturally to the place you want to drink it at. Don't force it. Don't add more than you need to, or don't add any if you're at a comfortable strength you like to drink it at. This is why it's great to have a full bottle because you can continue to play with it. When you have a night like tonight where it's just a sample, it's a little bit different. We understand that. Um, but yeah, don't uh, don't be afraid to play with water. But if, as you said, it gets hot after adding water. Probably if you had a second round, maybe you wouldn't add water, right? So there's just something we picked up on that. So that's cool to learn. I mean, that's just how we drink whiskey. We just evolved a little bit. And as Harmony said, something about diluting earlier. Um, when we find the whiskey's hot, you don't necessarily need to add water, but just when you sip a little bit, sip a little bit smaller and move it around your tongue a little bit, your saliva is going to dilute it. Maybe adding water is not what you want to do. Yeah, just take your time. Tiny sips often yeah. helps. I mean, if it's a big flavorful whiskey, a tiny sip and a little bit of saliva will go a long way. <laughs> um, number six, we've got two to go and we're kind of we're chatting a lot, so um, we're keeping you late. Hopefully, we're not keeping anybody too late here. So we'll move through these next two quick in case anybody has to boogie out, because these ones, I think, are two that should be compared. Um, and we've got a couple more topics we can talk about while we do these two. Um, 
the, the notes we're already getting are I smell BC on fire in summer, Andrew smells electrical fire. Um, that note, that electrical fire note, I love it. And there's a reason for that. And we're going to get a little bit geeky on that one here. Um, after smelling number six, number four smells like caramel and number three smells like fish and ocean. I love it. See, that's why we talked about bouncing back and forth and how context becomes everything here. And now you're able to articulate things that we didn't necessarily get because we didn't have any point of comparison. We've seen a whole bunch of different styles and a whole bunch of different ages and a whole bunch of different cast clothes. And that's what really gives us context for these. Which is awesome because I have now went back to number three to get the smelly fish and I smell pink peeps, those marshmallow peeps. But <laughs> bubble gum marshmallows. I hate marshmallows. <laughs> but that's what I smell now. I wanted fish, but that's not what I got. Okay. So this one, if anybody does fall in love with this whiskey, let's um let's be the good Samaritans here. Welcome every, to the club if you do fall in love, because I love Kilhoman. Yes. Um, every year we do an MS whiskey festival. Um, all benefits to the multiple sclerosis society. Obviously, COVID has really cramped that, and we still wanted to do a little something, even though it isn't nearly what we can do with the festival. Um, we talked to Andy Dunn, the local rep, and we spoke to Kill Holman, and we said we wanted to do a special bottling of Kill Holman. Uh, you'll notice it looks like it says Kilchoman or Kilcoman. It's pronounced Kilhoman. Again, he said Gallic was mean. Ignore that C, pretend it's not there, it's Kilhoman. Um, Kilhoman offered us up some of the oldest whiskey they had. This is a young distillery. It was founded in 2005 on the Isle of Isla, where everything like we talked about earlier is typically big and smoky and bonfire on the beach side kind of thing. Kilhoman is one of the new upstarts and they are amazing. They've captured lightning in a bottle to come back to that electrical fire comment. Uh, everything they've released from three years on has tended to be typically really, really exciting. So when we got offered this 14 year old, it wasn't because we were good people. We like to think we are. It wasn't because we were just that amazing in the whiskey world. We like to think we are. Twice we've been runner up for world whiskey retailer, pat on the back for ourselves. Um, it was because this was a charity endeavor. So 25 bucks on our side from every bottle of this sold is going to the MS. So we'd love to sell through this whole cask and do some good stuff there. Um, I adore this whiskey. I adore what Kilholman does. Um, it's heavily peated, of course. That electrical note you're getting, if you're reading whiskey tasting notes and you read the comments or the note, the knowledge, it has unfortunately become synonymous with just smoky PD whiskey. That's not what phenol means. That's not what phenolic compounds necessarily mean. Though some of them have direct correlation there. The smell of phenols directly are more like spent electrical, like a burnt motherboard. Like you've just blown out something electrical. There's been some kind of, some, something's been fried basically. Mm -hmm. That's the smell of phenols. And you typically get that in a lot of peated whiskey. It's, it's obviously a chemical thing when that, that peat smoke permeates the barley and all through the process, you've intensified it through distillation. You've also tweaked it through the fermentation process, of course, but look for that spent electrical mode. Electrical storm, um, a spoon in your microwave. <laughs> don't try it just to get that smell. I don't the taste smell, don't try that. Um, something along those lines. Now with that, with Kilhoma in this little Isla upstart distillery, look for, I'm gonna give you my tasting notes that I typically find in Kilhoma, in ex bourbon casks like this. Look for that salinity, that coastal influence. Look for some key lime, like sharp little lime. Look for a bit of cola, almost like if anybody's worked in a restaurant or a, a bar or any, a pub or anything like that, bibs of cola syrup. You know, when it's that really, really intense syrup, it's not had the water and carbonation added to it, that intense cola sort of note to it. Look for, look for some toasty pastry sort of notes to it and some light spices. Look for some black licorice, whorehound candy, anise, fennel, something like that. Um, behind it all, there's typically a little bit of rubber, char, tar, and there's a really profound sweetness within all of those. Somebody said anise, I think, there too. Mm, yeah. 
I always get lemon, little bits of lemon as well. Yeah. Tons of citrus on the Isle of Whiskey. Yeah. And on the palate, immediately it's savory barbecue, toast, like almost like bark from a brisket or ham or something. Yeah. The arrival right away on the palate, obviously it's big and smoky, but it's insanely sweet and syrupy too. Yeah. And viscous and oily. Wow. It's totally different than I was expecting. So we weren't even nice. We didn't even caution people that we were going to one of the heaviest peated whiskeys in the world there um, when we shifted over into Kilholman. Um, I think this is their floor maltings, which are a little bit lower in peat. So this might seem not as heavy as some might expect from one of the heaviest peated whiskeys in the world. But if uh, we didn't warn you what these big peaty whiskeys were, and it is, you know, you're new to it. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you know what the phenol count is on this? So I mean, they're typically 50, 55, I think. Yeah. At Kilholman, which really, I mean, doesn't matter necessarily because when we talk phenols, which we're not going to get into, it's uh, <laughs> Suzanne. <laughs> We're sorry, <laughs> you've come for an experience, you got one. <laughs> um, the, those counts are taken before uh, maturation, which plays a huge- uh, distillation, that's the barley phenol count. Pardon me, before the distillation and maturation. So it, it's, it doesn't really mean a lot, yeah. Okay, so what Harmony's talking about there, phenols, so peated whiskeys, the phenols in it that are giving you that smokiness and electrical note and everything that's going on in there, that's giving you that weird, weird character that these whiskeys have compared to the other Scotch whiskeys. Typically. Measured in phenolic parts per million or PPM. So when you hear people talk about peated whiskey and PPM, for a while there, it was the ultimate measuring contest. You know, it was the, um, the hop wars in the beer world, et cetera. For a while, two distilleries were going head to head, trying to get the peatiest whiskey in the world. One of them won, the other one has now announced a new whiskey to be coming later. So we are like sharks, believe it or not. We are insanely sensitive to phenols. Um, ladies, anybody like Suzanne is saying yuck, I hate to break it to you ladies, you're actually scientifically a little bit more attuned than men are. You're olfactory senses are just naturally stronger than men's. Uh, men have to work harder to get good at this kind of stuff. Women have to work, of course, just like anything else, but you're just, you're gifted more than we are. Um, but we pick up on these phenols like a shark with a drop of blood in the water. So a whiskey like a Bonahaven that's peated to two parts per million can sometimes have a slight peaty smokiness to it we're picking up on. A whiskey like Beaumore, is insanely peaty for a lot of people. And it's only 25 parts per million. 25 of those little molecular parts, atomic parts, whatever, are phenolic particles out of a million. And we're able to pick that up and it's strong parts. Mm -hmm. Talisker is only about 10 to 20 parts per million. I think about 18 is Talisker, if I recall. Open is even lower. And these are whiskeys that people recognize as peated. Um, the highest peating level we've ever seen in the world's peatiest whiskey to date is only 309 parts of Kuma. Yeah. That's crazy to me. That's how smoky some of these are. So to come back to Harmony's question, this Kilholman, Kilholman, when they opened in 2005, asked for Art Bank Spec Malt, so one of the peatiest whiskeys in the world, which is 55 parts per million, but they marry in some of their own floor malt in it. So we looked at those malt floors when we were laid out, their peating level comes in lower at about 20. I think this is closer to the 20. This might be their all their own floor maltings here because this peat level is actually quite low. Mm -hmm. And that's telling you what we're able to pick up on peating levels because other kilohomes are way stronger. Or it just shows what additional aging can do. Yes, that's the key. It's hard to say, right? Like sometimes the, the peat is softer with age and sometimes it gets more intense. Peat shouldn't get more intense because it's a volatile. So I think that's where some people get really disappointed when they spend $700 on a Lafroy 25, for example, because right. they look at a, a Lafroy 10, they're like, oh, it's so peaty. My 25 years, it must be huge. And then you get to the 25 and it's like, oh, beautiful, pretty and soft. And the smoke is faint and you're like, what the hell? 
that yeah. smokiness is fading in the barrel over time, just like everything else is changing too, right? Um, right. Beer drinkers, if you're IPA fans, don't leave your IPAs sitting for too long. That's why they typically put best before dates on them. And that's why we keep them in the fridge most of the time because they're more volatile. That hoppiness, that bitterness, the tropical notes, they're all going to fade quickly, even in a can. So peat is a volatile characteristic. If you like this style, drink it young. That's where you get the most. That's a beautiful whiskey, Harmony. I don't know about you, but I love that one. I think it's so good. And I don't know why it's not on the back bar at work. It's like buried in the back back somewhere. <laughs> Because if I put it out, everybody drinks it. If it's in the back, I drink it. I'd be sitting in the back with my feet up, not packing and shipping orders. I would be just sipping on this. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Should we compare it to the last one? Yes, please. I have uh, Pete's Beast as a lineup is quite intriguing um, because it leads you to believe that these Petey Beasts are going to be Isla Malts and that... Uh, is not the case for all of them in this lineup. True. So Isla, when we refer to the Isla malts, when you see those bottles that say Islay on them, it's not pronounced Islay. It's Isla. Isla. Um, an island. It's an island, yes, called Isla. Um, and just because this is a bugaboo of mine, it's not Glen. Glen Morangi, we get a lot, or um, I, I don't even know how else you've heard it. Um, you literally have the word orange in it, Glen Morangi, uh, and it has an orangey sort of profile. My little gallic hit for the night. Um, so with these last three, we went from big, big, heavy sherry to big, big, heavy peat. Harmony and I decided the last one should be big peat and sherry combined. Now you've taken heavily peated malt and put it in a cask once held sherry. So now you've taken both of those last two styles we had and slammed them together. So let's see what we get here. Still smoky as hell. Yeah. There's that rubber note. It's less medicinal though this time, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, I smell like a fireplace in this. <laughs> Elena says smoke and syrup. I get something that's like dirty um, engine shop here too. Something that's got like that black, greasy kind of note to it. Um, again, rubber, warm welly boots, bicycle tires, or some kind of shredded hot rubber. You mean like when they're filling the asphalt on the, <laughs> the road? <laughs> Mm. So there's all sorts of, because we love those stories in the Scotch whiskey world, but the stories are what really romance you. Um, you know, a night like tonight where we're trying to share a bunch of information means we tell less stories in the ocean. Um, whiskey stories are the greatest stories. They tend to be so much fun. So the, the distillery workers used to get, a, they used to get drowned several times a day. Uh, so the new workers, the young kids, they show up, you know, decades ago. And there'd be rations poured out a couple of times. And these kids would be throwing back this whiskey at 17, 18 years old, um, an ounce and a half, two ounces of time of stuff at 63 and a half percent. And they'd be legless through half their shift, right? When dramming stopped, when it became, you know, oh, health and safety, apparently we can't be drunk on shift working with this dangerous explosive equipment. What's that all about? <laughs> um, yeah. Or even before that, you know, there was a lot of, um, Thirst. There's a healthy thirst in Scotland. There's, there are very, I have Scottish, anyways, I'm going to be very careful what I say. Um, there's untold stories of welly boots filled to sloshing for distillery workers to walk out in. Um, and they go home and they dump their boots out and drink their whiskey. Uh, anything where you could steal extra drowns kind of thing. But of course, you've just run in probably a 12 hour shift, because usually you run a day shift or a night shift. So you probably run a 12 hour shift of distilling in a 30 degree still house kind of thing. Um, and then you found a way to sneak into the warehouse and, or in the still house and pour a bunch of spirit into your boot. <laughs> you know, to me, that's just 
really, really intense sock soup. <laughs> that doesn't fit at all. But um, desperate. Better at the end of the day than at the beginning. Sorry, what's that? Sorry, I said better at the end of the day than at the beginning. I suppose so, but I, well, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. You just reminded me of that movie. Is it The Angel's Share? The Angel's Share. So he breaks in and steals all the, the booze. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great movie. A great movie. Yeah. All right. So this whiskey, um, I use this analogy for something else in the store, but it fits perfectly here. These last two whiskeys, the big peaty smoky ones we've had, this is truly Betty and Veronica. Um, the Kilholman is elegant. It's lighter. It's fruitier. It's probably a safer choice for a lot of people. This Pete's, Pete's Beast is the dirty girl. This one's like, this is way more Veronica. This is <laughs> that dirty, dark, um, fishy, tarry note. It's bold, man. This one's a really dark whiskey. I love it. It's the dirty sherry that I know and love. I'm, I'm really curious and people by all means, throw your comments, which you prefer on those two styles. I'm so confused by your comment because I thought the um, Pete's be uh, Beast was like way more sophisticated and complex than um, the the um, the Kukuman. Um I would have given it the opposite description of what you just gave. In a sense, it's more complex. You, you could be right. You're, you're not wrong for that because you've taken the same style, basically a whiskey, but you've added in another dimension by putting it into sherry in, in the second one. Mm -hmm. So you have, in a sense, made it more complex in style. Um, I'd I, say complex and elegant, whereas the other one's just like, bam, smoke in your face. Like it's very bold. And I would describe that one more as the dirty girl than the, the Pete's Beat. Uh, beast I'd say that one's a lot more refined and sophisticated but complex and multiple facets there was yeah, a seems like sophisticated wearing fur with a long cigarette like she knows what she's doing she's been around and she's got a raspy voice and she don't take no shit <laughs> the kill woman wants to be that lady <laughs> there was a, a fantastic um just one second uh, there was a fantastic debate going on on a website called Connoisseur. Um, some of you may know it. And I remember a couple of people were arguing about which was better between a couple of whiskeys. And a third guy jumped in and he was always the, the older, more reasoned voice. Um, I, I quite got to like the guy without ever having met him. That's kind of the way the whiskey world works. Um, and he stopped these two guys from going at it, like a couple of young bucks, you know, trying to show off a little bit. And he goes, don't you get it? Like, it's good that you guys like different whiskeys. If we all like the same thing, we'd all be in love with my wife. And I would just <laughs> checkmate, right? Like, well done. You know, if we all like the same thing, if we're all excited about the same whiskey, when we go to the shelves, they're empty. And the shelves are full of all the other crap that we don't really want, right? Um, I like that our taste buds take us different ways. And I think that's the biographical part that Harmony spoke to earlier, where our tasting notes come from the places we've been and the things we remember and stuff. And I think we develop our tastes. One person loves this, one person loves that. Um, and it has been that way since we were kids. We loved our grandma's baking, but maybe our friends came over and didn't like it too much. Or we had a favorite meal, but when our friends came over, they didn't like it or whatever it might be. Um, I, I like that there's a story there. And to me, I'll take Betty in this case, though Veronica is usually a really good. <laughs> I have to step out for just 20 seconds. I'll be right back here. No worries. Um, yeah, I, uh, I've enjoyed this lineup. There's a lot of individuality for sure. And everyone is, has its moment, has its shining place. I think the Kilhoman for me has definitely been a winner. And I think it's because I'm biased because I just love Kilhoman. <laughs> uh, I'd always have since my first one. Um, but the Dap Mill was awesome and then when I went back to smell it again looking for that fish and I got candy I was super happy <laughs> sorry for that didn't mean to be rude there 
Uh, no, that, that's exciting to me. And we're going to do something now before we even go any further. Actually, let's do a quick reveal on this because we didn't actually talk about this. This is an island distillery uh, in the Isle of Mull, where we actually get the name Calgary and Banff and stuff from. Uh, we pilfered them from the Scots, believe it or not. Um, we did have a discussion about a week ago, Harmony and I, about all the Scottish influx to Canada and such. Um, we've stolen a lot of the, the nomenclature from over there. Um, this is a distillery called Tobermory on the Isle of Mull that produces largely unpeated whiskey under the Tobermory name, but also produces a whiskey called Leche part-time as a heavily peated variant of the expression. Smart. In case things go south, they've got two different styles they can fall back on. Um, Leche is probably the one that's in more demand nowadays because people are looking for that funky or smoky, dirty character. This is an undeclared Leche. Almost certainly, we can't be certain. We were actually referring to it as an island malt at one point, and they came down on us and slapped us down. So it doesn't say island on the bottle, doesn't it? And we all went, oh, shit, we've been saying the wrong thing this whole time. And then as soon as we started brainstorming, we're like, yeah, it's no brand. It's, uh, it's, it's got the hallmarks of Leche. So Leche, if you're looking for it, looks like Ledeg, Harmony, as she just put it in there. Um, it's pronounced Leche. Elk is mean. Um, this one, I'm going to be totally honest with you. Harmony and I did not pick this for the lineup. We had a different one chosen. And unfortunately, we had to pull that one because we just didn't have enough of it. And then we replaced it with this one. And I'm glad because it shows a different dimension still. So I'm really curious to see what I really liked on this one. And I think the first, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, like, it's way saltier. I'm finding the finish is saltier and drier and nuttier than the first one, than the Kilhoman, if we're comparing uh, styles of peak. It's so rubbery to me, like bicycle tire, like um, rubber boots, welly boots, we call them, right? Yeah. yeah that. That's a, that note is huge for me. And uh, it's there, but I, I get lots of dark, dark fruit, dark chocolate. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, why don't we, while we're chatting here, and we're going to open it up in a little bit here for a few minutes too, um, let's run a quick poll. It'll give you a chance to tell us what your first favorite and second favorite whiskeys were of the night. You'll get two votes. Unfortunately, I know there's a couple of folks here that are um, groups of two and such. You're stuck with one vote. So whoever's uh, the, the soundest sleeper, I'd say maybe defer your vote to your partner just in case they decide to click in as they're sleeping or something. <laughs> we'll launch this poll here and you can throw in your vote as to what you think is the best. Do note, Chelsea set this up. They're not necessarily in the order we tasted them in. I can see that right now. So make sure you're actually choosing the one you want, not just the order. Shall be right back, Kurt. Yeah. All right, so while people are doing that, uh, we've just lost harmony for a second or two. If anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them out. I'm really good at making up answers. Um, I've been professionally lying about this stuff for years now. Okay. So. <clears throat> and feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question too. You don't need to just throw them in comments. Ah, so we did, a, oh, right, we posted a picture and we probably wrote on the website. Yes, there was supposed to be a Kalila in here. Um, it was a Kalila that was heavily sherried and heavily peated. Um, unfortunately, just with the sale weekend, it cleared us out and we just didn't have, we pulled this lineup together months ago when there was a mad panic to, uh, we do things a little bit backwards at KWM. We come up with an idea for tasting and then Chelsea pressures us and pressures us and pressures us to give her the lineup and everything. And we go, yeah, 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 we'll get to it until she's at the point of, we have to announce this on the website tomorrow. Everybody needs to pull their lineups together and give me the costs now. So Harmony and I pulled this together a couple months ago um, and unfortunately the whiskey stocks have changed. So I'm disappointed too with you, Paul, but I think this was a perfect way to cap that tasting because it gave us some really, really different dimension. I have 13 of 15 who have participated. We'll give it another minute or so. And she's back. I guess he's back. Which one are you sipping, Harmony? I'm 
just going back and I'm smelling them all because I often will go through it, get to the peat, go, oh yeah, I love the peat. And then I don't go back. <laughs> um, so I'm just giving them all a final nose. If you still have some left, if you're bouncing back and forth, to me that um, Strathclyde now has all sorts of notes of like caramel corn. Um, what was that box stuff? Crunchy Munch? Oh, Johnny yeah. Walker is balanced beautifully now, spice and um, fruit. Still a little bit prickly for some spiciness there though. Yeah, I, I do like Johnny Walker. He gets a bad rap because of that darn red label. But <laughs> the um, Daff Mill to me now is um, yeah. a bit of licorice, like red licorice and black licorice kind of married together. A little bit of black licorice, mostly red. Mostly red for sure. Loads of like strawberry cherry notes. Oh, and that Anok is just stunning. Like Swedish berries. That's what I get. On the Anok? Oh, no, Daff Mill. Daff Mill. Yeah, Swedish berries would make sense. That's probably right in line with that red licorice note I'm getting. That Anok has such a great, great balance for me. Um, all results are in, but let's go through the last couple again, too. Oh, that tea and is just raisin soup at this point. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Okay. Very cool. All right, there you go, folks. So favorite of the night was the Daft Mill for the number one votes and the Strathclyde coming in second. Very cool. Yeah, a love of that 26 year old. Yeah. Well, it's kind of cool when you can do an introduction to whiskey and your first whiskey of the night is 26 years old and 52 and a half percent. Totally. I mean, in general, in, in today's whiskey day and age to try anything, 26 years is becoming to become quite a feat. Like the it prices does. are just can be crazy. Um, Johnny Walker celebratory. Good. Really good balance showing on like everybody liked everything. Like there was a good spread of what people liked. And the Kilholman, love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you mind repeating five regions again? Everybody says Scotland. Uh, yeah. Highlands, um, the Highlands tend to be everything above. You can literally see a map of Scotland where the, the lowland divide sits kind of thing. There's usually just a belt that runs across the lower middle of Scotland. The Highlands is everything above that, typically. And then within the Highlands, Speyside sits as a little insect where the concentration of distilleries was just so intense that they had to give it its own regional um, nomenclature. Um, the Highlands tend to be a little more floral, a little more coastal old style. Speyside, a little more stone fruity, berries, etc. Then you've got Isla as the third, Campbellton as the fourth, and Sorry? Lowland. Lowlands, yes. Highlands, the lowlands were the opposite there. Lowlands, lighter and floral. Lowlands um, was down to um, three distilleries for a little bit there. Um, now there's an influx of new ones that have started up, Daft Mill included there. Um, a fun little whiskey story before we move on too far here. We were talking about Campbellton earlier in Springbank. And this is why we love whiskey. Um, Campbellton. Once the whiskey capital of the world, 32 distilleries, they were down to two about 20 years ago or so. And the Scotch Whiskey Association said, all right, Campbellton is no longer going to be a whiskey region. And of course, the locals are up in arms and pitchforks and torches and everything and saying, hell no, Campbellton is a whiskey region. It was once the most important place in the whiskey world. Everybody wanted our whiskey, not happening. And the SWA said, laugh off, touch. And Headley Wright, the owner of the Springbank Distiller, I saw somebody passionately screaming, as much as you can passionately scream, something in the chat section. Springbank, yay. Um, Headley Wright, cantankerous old man, um, single gay man who has no offspring to leave the distillery to, has decided he's leaving it to the town of Campbellton. We adore Headley. He's such a rebel. He's the most amazing guy in the whiskey industry. Headley appealed to the SWA and said, okay, you want to strip us of regional status, but the lowlands only have three distilleries and you're letting them remain a region. And SWA 
bigger heads of the organization anyways said, yeah, but they've got three and you've got two. So they're going to stay originally in the Appalachian. And Headley goes, not going to fly. So he bought the old ruined Glengyle distillery behind them, cleaned out literally a foot deep of bird shit from inside this distillery, raided the old Ben Wavis distillery and bought all of their old equipment, piping everything for I think $100,000, bought a mill for I can't remember if it was one pound, just as a gentleman's agreement type thing, to get this mill out of where it previously sat. And I can't remember the story. It'll come back to me later, and I'll sit up at three in the morning going, aha. <laughs> I basically retrofitted this old defunct distillery and restarted the Glengyle distillery. If you've ever seen Kilcarran malts, that's Glengyle. Headley goes, I bought a distillery. I'm opening it up. We now have three distilleries again. So the SWA had to back down to Headley going, F you, we are not losing our status. So the guy literally opened a distillery out of spite. And for the first chunk of Kilcarran's or Glengyle's existence, it only produced about four to six weeks a year. They gradually increased it. So now they're producing a couple months a year. But that to me is why we love whiskey. It's the stories. That was so super cool. Thanks for joining us, Enzo. We hope you have a good night. And Paul says now Kilcarran is one of the great single malts. It's true, very much in the spring bank. Yeah. All right, so we saw some cool whiskeys tonight. We talked about a lot of cool topics, but to me, in the harmony, we probably stay the same. These tastings are not for us. We kind of know a lot of this stuff, of course, and sometimes we learn a little bit about the whiskeys as we go, but these tastings are for you. So if you have questions, Feel free to throw them in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself and have a go at us. Throw a question at you at us, anything you want to know. Harmony, anything you want to add while we're letting them have a chance to say they want to say if they do want to. No, but for those of you who are taking off, uh, a thank you. We did go a bit long tonight. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to spend your evening with us. Uh, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoyed it as well. Have a good night. Um, for those who are staying, thanks for staying and joining us. I had a fun night. I was really happy to try a bunch of new whiskeys. And uh, I was surprised by what I liked. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so we're not going to sway opinions now because everybody's voted. What was yeah. your favorite of the night? Um, hey, Harmony and Chad. Yeah. What does ABV stand for? Um, alcohol by volume. Alcohol by volume. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I also want to thank you so much. It was a great night. Thanks so much. Oh, you're so welcome. Harmony and I have done two of these together now. We did Burns Night last week, and I kind of like doing these tastings with her because she knows her shit, and we can kind of just hang out and chat about stuff that we're both fortunate enough not to be too jaded about at this point in our lives it's still all fun it's still um it's still all romantic to us um dave i, I don't know which david said that i, I love I, it he says kurt you are the tom brady of the whiskey world <laughs> i'm a patriot <laughs> fan um uh, i'm a little emotional today because tom brady officially announced his retirement so <laughs> Probably the wrong day after some whiskeys, you're going to see me get all teary and shit. Nobody needs to see me. No, I'm kidding. It's not that bad. But if my wife comes home and finds me blubbering on the couch, I'm blaming you, David. Uh, appreciate the compliment. But uh, yeah. Um, um, Paul says there was a question earlier about not being able to smell due to high alcohol. Maybe speak to ways to mitigate that. Great question. Harvey, do you want it? Yeah. Well, one of the ways to, to do that is... Um, just exactly how Kurt had said earlier, by covering your glass and shaking it up, smelling your hands, um, by rubbing your hands and smelling kind of the, the barrel expression. Um, by doing that, the alcohol is evaporating. Um, so you're just smelling the alcohol. Another way uh, when you're smelling, if the alcohol is high, keep your mouth open. I, I know that it seems counterproductive to everything we've been taught. But by allowing that little bit of space in your palate that the alcoholic vapors can escape out your mouth and, and not get all caught up in your sinuses. So keeping your mouth slightly open is a really good trick. Um, adding water 
also dilutes the alcohol, makes it easier to smell, easier to taste. Um, but I mean, sometimes you have good days and you have bad days. Like when I started out today, I said, you know, like I can't smell through my left nostril. I'm only getting something out of my right nostril. And then like some people are inherently stronger on one side of their body than the other. Um, it's just practice. I find, um, and just finding out day to day what works. Um, sometimes if I eat too many spicy or garlicky things on my lunch break, then I'm hooped for it tasting. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, Everything Harmony just said is dead on accurate. Um, I'll harken back to what we said earlier. Take a tiny sip, like sip small, move it all around your mouth for a few seconds, like coat everything with it. It kind of creates almost like a buffer for the alcohol after that. Um, then your next sip is going to be easier. Um, Elena says, are all stills made of copper? Um, no, good question. But generally, not generally, 100% um, copper is going to be involved. Copper is key. Copper literally strips out the sulfuric compounds and the impurities and stuff. Copper, when you look at it under a microscope, so like the inside of a pot still, it looks like Velcro up close. It's actually grabbing hold of the compounds we don't want and stripping that nastiness out. Um, also, that copper, it's getting eroded by the alcohol, too. Nastiness is in there. That's that green stuff we saw coming out earlier tonight. Um, the copper is a purifying agent for the spirit. Um, those stills will work for a few decades before they have to be either patched or replaced. Usually, they'll pull up, okay, the boiler belly is needing replacement or the neck needs replacement. Copper is expensive, of course, and in a lot of demand, so they'll patch before they'll replace. And generally, that copper is going to be a few millimeters thick, so it's heavy duty. And these stills are massive, right? Um, the copper is key to the process, but those grainy whiskeys you talked about, the Strathclydes and stuff, generally they're going to be big column stills. The still is not made of copper entirely, but there's a lot of copper inside the still that's helping to purify that spirit as well. Um, and then there's going to be uh, the potential of copper as well in the, con in the condensing unit. So when you're distilling, you're capturing the vapors. Alcohol and water um, boil off at different temperatures. Water is 100%, alcohol is more around 80. I can't remember the exact number, 79.8 or 80. Something. I can't remember exactly, but it's around 80%. So as you go up over 80%, the alcohol is boiling. So that's the alcohol vapors rising up. That's what you want to capture, right? That's the stuff that we're looking for. Um, however, as that is coming up, we obviously don't want all of it. We already talked about that. We cut off the four shots and the things. We just want the good heart of the run. But also in the condensing of that spirit back to a liquid form, we either have worm tubs where that still is shaped like a big onion. The copper comes all the way up. It curves over the neck and comes down. If it's a worm tub, that copper coil just continues in a big, long snake, basically inside a big tub of water. That water is going to help cool the vapors as they're going through this copper. It's going to condense it into a liquid and capture that liquid. All of that copper contact helps. Even though it sounds like it's a lot by going through this big long snake, hence the term worm tubs, that's what they're called, a big tub with a copper worm inside of it, tubs filled with water. Um, the other form of condensation or condensing is um, shell and tube condensers, where it's a big stainless steel or whatever unit, but inside are loads and loads and loads of copper tubes. So those copper tubes that the, the vapor is passing by and passing through or helping to purify too. So always copper, but whether it's actual pot stills or column stills, it's going to differentiate whether the still is actually copper. Yeah. You, you won't ever get like a fully stainless steel operation. Um, you have to have some copper in there somewhere. There's almost certainly. I haven't heard of anybody doing just stainless steel. Maybe there is, and I don't know what they would actually end up with as a, a new product, but generally it's going to be copper. Mm -hmm. no, just, uh, really interesting. I'm a chemist, so I'm like yeah. loving to delve into the science side of it too. Whiskey is so much chemistry and those of us that do what we do, we get the elementary, we, we hear terms, we do a little bit of research, we go, oh yeah, I get that part, I get that part, I get that part. And then we start hearing all the real geeky stuff thrown around and get the, the, the people that end up high in the whiskey world. Um, as their master blenders and stuff, they tend to be chemists by trade. Rachel Berry, who helped create Ugadol, one of the greatest whiskeys in the world, as far as I'm concerned, for Ardbeg, who later went on to work for Bean Suntory and is now with um, 
the Ben Riek family under the Brown Forman family, who will Jeff Daniels. Um, so it's Ben Riek, Greg Glass, uh, uh, Glenn Tronick. Rachel Berry's palette is absolutely incredible. Um, and a chemist again who has insane, insane um, senses and knowledge. Like she's just a beast of it. A fantastic woman too. This tiny little firecracker of a personality that's so amazing, so generous, and so she's just she's a light when you meet her. She's amazing. Oh, but awesome. She's given us amazing whiskeys too along the way. It's really cool. Yeah. She's lovely. Yeah, absolutely. And then I guess also food pairings. What's the best thing to pair with Scott? Yeah, absolutely. Everything can go. I mean that there's enough varietal variety in scotch to find a whiskey to pair with whatever you're, you're eating. Um, I love my classic snack on the couch. Uh, whiskey pairing is Chicago mixed popcorn, some caramel, some cheddar, and I can pick through it for whatever I want. Um, I do that a lot. Um, but I was just chatting with one of the ladies that works at the cheese shop next door. And she says, I can build you a cheese pairing for every whiskey. Uh, so that's something that I'm actually going to uh, do a little bit more research on and maybe build an event where we just do like cheese and meat and, and whiskey or just cheese. I've done a couple um, chocolate and whiskey pairing events for the store. Mm -hmm. um, where I worked with Bernard Calibo for the first one where they came and they brought like 30 different, I, I gave them the whiskeys, or I told them what types of whiskey, how they were going to be flavored, sort of. Mm -hmm. They came up with about 30 different chocolates. They brought them all in. We sat down and tasted through the chocolates together. I tried them used a few whiskeys and we built a tasting room. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Love you. I've, I've wanted to do like a donuts and whiskey pairing because <laughs> I think that would be super fun because I like donuts um, and you can put bacon on it like you can make it work. <laughs> well, covered bacon and, and good sherry whiskey is really good. Yeah yeah like a, like a maple glaze with bacon and pair it with this like Pete's Beast would be lovely. Um, but, but the truth is it's an experience it's not necessarily a, a good pairing. For uh, sure. What, what I mean is like, it's like whiskey and cigars. The cigar smoke is gonna dull your palate for the whiskey. The whiskey is gonna anesthetize for the cigars. You're gonna lose all the nuances of both, but the experience together is great. It's the same thing. Whiskey pairs really well with cheese in a sense and really well with chocolate in a sense, all that kind of stuff. But the dairy oiliness of both of those is gonna actually fight the whiskey. The whole experience is really nice, but if you're looking for accurate tasting notes or anything, it's not going to work. It's more like, do you enjoy those things together? Yeah, those things actually kind of do work together, even though they're not necessarily working together, if that makes sense. Whiskey's more your after or your aperitif. Typically have wine with dinner over here. <laughs> My two cents. <laughs> Depends. If you're having like a nice, sweet pulled pork, you can bring your whiskey to the table. Like the, there's not going to be much conflict i don't think i'm glad you said that made a good comment though uh the clash often happens with spicy food and i would agree with that um it, it's kind of goes along that same thing like if you don't like spicy food don't bring your ipa to pair with your spicy food it's only going to make it more spicy and more intense yeah i i love spicy food but the spice just kills your palate you cannot taste anything after that so yeah. avoid spicy foods. Every other every other food pretty much goes with with mm -hmm. any any scotch or any whiskey, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, guys, thanks very much. This was awesome. awesome. The, the the topic beginner <laughs> is doesn't fit the lineup you guys picked. It was an awesome lineup, and definitely yeah. not definitely not definitely not beginners whiskeys. Definitely not introductory whiskeys. Cool. Which is great because it hopefully will open you up to just trying new things and not the the everyday kind of what you see on your local bar. Yeah, I told a buddy of mine I was doing this tasting. He says, "Well, why would you do that?" I mean, but I said, "Well, they've got Daft Mill. What more do you need <laughs> to join the tasting than have Daft Mill?" So yeah. awesome! Thanks, guys. It's Appreciate so it. Awesome. I think we have to acknowledge Harmony too. Harmony's like she said, she's kind of newer to our team, Paul, um, but she'll she'll get to the point because she obviously does tastings and stuff with us already. 
where she's determining these lineups for herself, for her own tastings too, where it's not her and I picking together or anything like that. Um, these tastings for us are also a bit of a vanity project. We have things we want to taste and we want to build lineups to share our narrative. So I think when Harmony and I were, because we tag teamed this, we pulled whiskeys together, we both wanted to do and stuff. She picked some, I picked some. Um, it kind of came down to, we don't want to do a boring intro to whiskey. Like that's something you do in person with a bunch of people that are looking for date nights and they, they want to keep it simple and stuff. We wanted to do something that could be a refresher, could be a first introduction and let people see how deep this stuff goes. But either way, introduction to whiskey and introductory whiskeys, everybody always, always like, okay, these are entry level whiskeys. Entry level whiskeys, what? Price point? Great. Yeah. Those are probably crappy whiskeys that are going to deter people from drinking them again. Let's pour them some good whiskeys, tell them why this is an introduction to this style of whiskey and let them make up their own minds. So we tried to pick really cool whiskeys that we thought were great, but do an introduction to whiskey tasting. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. We have a great job, Kurt. We're so lucky. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Any other it. questions? All right. I think we've run later than we expected to. And I think um, I think uh, we're probably holding people up at this point because we've seen it. <laughs> well, if nobody has any questions, then we've done our job, right? High five. That's right. <laughs> Good night, guys. Thank you. Good, Good night. night. Thanks. Anybody that's got any questions, you know where to find us. Give us a call at KWM. We love to talk with Ski. Even better, pop in because we can show you some cool stuff too. Times will be better soon. Um, we're all crossing our fingers. Even if they don't seem to get better, we're going to have to normalize this somehow to where we can get back to something a little more normal. We're not going to get into any of that kind of stuff aside from saying on behalf of us at KWM, we can't wait to get back to the point where we can pour you samples when you come into the store, where we can do sit down tastings in person. That's the real crux of our job. Not telling you things are good, pouring it for you and telling you why we love it or you know, listening to what you think is what you're looking for, pouring it for you or pouring you something that might contrast that and having you get excited about it. We will get back to that point soon. So that's the really, 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 really cool part of the job that we're looking forward to sharing with you guys sooner than later. That's what we do for a living when times are normal and times are good. We will get back there. Crossing our fingers for sooner than later. That's all it that comes up to. Um, any other questions? Like I said, give us a call. We'd love to talk with you anytime. Harmony, anything you want to add before we call her? No, that's great. Cool. I need a snack, but otherwise, I'm. This is super fun night. Yeah, cool. it was a great lineup. Good group, good cost, uh, good comments, good uh, questions too. Yeah. Cool. Have a okay. good night. Thanks for um, doing this with us tonight. Thanks for spending your evening with us, Harmony. Great co-pilot. Thanks for doing this with me. See you at work tomorrow. Yeah, you will. All right. Good night. All right.